Welcome to Mic Drop, the podcast where relevancy is irrelevant and we don't give a shit about your feelings. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, it's both an honor and a pleasure to welcome my next guest to the podcast. He spent 32 years on active duty in the Army, uh, four years of which in Ranger Battalion and 13 years in Special Forces. After that, he got a commission as an ER doctor and went back to the Joint Medical Augmentation uh, Unit. <clears throat> he said five global war on terror deployments after that, two to Afghanistan, one to Iraq, two to North Africa. With that many inoculations going uh, going to those places, you got to have more sticks than a fucking voodoo doll in, in Louisiana. A little bit. Uh, he's the owner of Graybeard Performance. He's also the author of Honed, Finding Your Edge as a Man Over 40, which we're going to talk about today. He's a modern-day Welsh Ragnar that still drinks from the skulls of his enemies. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, Dr. Mike Simpson. Thank you for having me, man. Appreciate it. Thanks for coming. I appreciate you taking time to uh, uh, come up here. I know you live in Texas also, which is nice that uh, you can at least drive instead of have to mask up and jump on a fucking plane. But right. um, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's neat to finally meet you. I know we've been talking about doing this for a little while and, uh, you know, in going through your book, there's uh, a lot of things I want to talk about in there as well as Jesus Christ, the amount of time you've spent in the, uh, in the army, getting your hands dirty for uncle Sam. So yeah, a lot of miles. Yeah. <laughs> uh, have you ever sharted in public? In public? No, but, uh, I have, I've sharted in free fall. Is that right? Yeah. So, uh, this was, uh, my first attempt at military free fall. I had to go twice. I had a little accident. It wasn't because of the sharding. <laughs> so uh, I was actually, uh, my stomach was really, really, really bothering me. And uh, you know how it is at altitude. They say at, at altitude, oddly enough, farts start to have squared off edges. And it, that sounds funny when you hear it. I didn't know they said and, that. And then, oh, when you go to altitude, <laughs> you feel it. It's like, it's like these feel like square pegs coming yep. out of a round hole. <laughs> so I was in a lot of discomfort and I was all the way towards the nose of the aircraft. I'm like, man, I just want to get out of here. I just want to get out of here. Finally, jumped out, fallen, everything's fine. I get down to pull altitude, and I pull. I had a little bit of a hard pull, like and it literally jerked the shit out of me. <laughs> so I had a wet one, which I didn't notice at the time, because uh, you don't feel it when you're under canopy. And then uh, got to the ground, flared, landed, and I went to take a step. And I'm like, what's that? I smelled something and felt something <laughs> at the same time, so that, yeah, that's, that's my great. that's my sh uncomfortable shark story. What uh, what what happened uh, in terms of you getting kicked out or not not making? Yeah, so that was the next week. Actually, I had an incident where uh, this and free fall. Did you go through military I, free fall? No, not uh, not not the military free fall. No. Okay, yeah. So they had a uh, was, was that a Fallon or what's that was it in the vat fallon or no so uh the, my first attempt was in the 80s and oh, it was okay. uh you uh you went from bragg to wright patterson air force base to do the to the, do the pressure chamber in the tunnel and then back to bragg for all your jumps there was no oh, wow. yuma oh, like sure. there is now and it was a lot different back then not all of the instructors were affis not not even all of them were were free fall jump masters and it was a little bit more of the wild west and uh I, they changed instructors on me midway through the course because my instructor was going to military free fall jump master. And I got a new instructor and the, and it was the graded ruck exercise, what they call gate two. And, uh, he hooked up my rucksack with one strap basically oh, sure. all the way out. And I didn't know it till I got into free fall. And, uh, that strap came off of my aviator's kit bag. And all of a sudden my rucksack was flying behind me at this funny angle. And I went into a flat spin. Yeah. And uh, couldn't counter the flat spin and ending ended up uh, when you spin that much, you're you lose your vision because all the blood rushes to your head. So uh, I could see blurry shapes and that was it. And I I pulled. That was really the only way that I was going to get out of that spin anyway. And uh, ended up. Uh, so I had a flat spin, which is an uncontrolled descent. So that would have got me kicked out anyway. Then I had a, a high pull because I ended up pulling it like five grand instead of four grand. So I had two reasons for them to kick me yeah. out wow. because of that. So um, did it take uh, years before you were able to go back and do it again? It did. So the, the rule at the time was you had to wait a year to come back. And uh, I had I had exactly a year left on my enlistment, 
when I went. So I knew that I wasn't going to clear because I didn't have any, any intention of, of, uh, of reenlisting on active duty. I got out of Ranger Battalion, went into the 20th group for a couple of years, which we, we talked about. Um, so it wasn't really until I got to 7th group, after I went to the Q course and everything, got to 7th group, and I got on the order of merit list to go back but I was perpetually getting bumped down on the order of merit list because I was a I was a special forces demolition sergeant first. I did that for a little over three years, and then when I went off to go to medic school and come back, even though I came back to the same battalion, I went back to the bottom of the OML because I was a new guy now. Yeah. So I didn't work my way back up the order of merit list to go again until ninety nine. God damn, that's <laughs> a good old military for you, right? <laughs> what's uh, what's the best prank you've ever pulled? Best prank! Oh, best prank I ever pulled. So uh, damn, it didn't take any any time. To no, and it's a one immediately popped to mind. So, uh, buddy of mine, fellow physician, he was actually one of my chief residents. Uh, he was the last doctor to get to go through the special forces qualification course as a doctor because uh, he had been a battalion surgeon in SF. So he did a little bit different route than me. You know, I did the whole, I did the action guy stuff first, and then went to med school. He went. Uh, undergraduate medical school and then got a battalion surgeon's job out of residency and but did such a great job they said hey we're going to reward you by letting you go to the sf sfqc and, and earning your tab and your beret so um we were both in Fayetteville at the time i was in attending at womack and uh he was in i believe in language school and he herniated a disc in his back on a road march so severely that like he was having like numbness in his legs and everything else. But they said, Hey, we can fix this surgically. You'll only be out of training for a couple weeks and you'll be back in it. So he got scheduled for back surgery and I was on shift the day he got his back surgery and I made a deal with the surgeon who did the surgery. I said, as soon as you guys close up and he's going to post-op, call me. So they did. Is it fucked up that I'm thinking that you cut his legs off and like jokes on you, we amputated him. I didn't go that far. <laughs> Almost as bad it is. I ran upstairs, and while he was still in post op, I uh, I peeled off the adhesive and I stuck a colostomy bag. <laughs> That's fucked up. So he woke up and he had a colostomy bag, and he was like, "What? <laughs> we couldn't save it." Yeah, and I was like, I was standing there. I was like, "Sorry, dude." <laughs> we had to take your dick. And uh, all the nurses in recovery started laughing. Yeah. So it took him a second to realize, okay. He's in post op. He shouldn't be in post op anyway, and they're all laughing. So yeah. this has to. So he just reached down and he pulled it yeah. off. But, yeah, that's fucking. But for funny. just a split second yeah. there, you thought he it was no the best asshole. practical joke I'd ever played. Dude, that's fucking. That's a good, good goddamn joke. <laughs> that's awesome. That's fucking great. Um, did he ever try to get you back? Uh, or he's, get you back? He maybe he's still planning it. Yeah. He, he might. He might still be. As a matter yeah. of fact. God, that's awesome. <laughs> that's fucking great. I, I, there was a kind of a similar story. I mean, the it, it had to do with a. A, a catheter, I, you know, a good friend of mine had dual elbow surgery and the, and the surgeon was a friend of ours. And so he let me scrub in and observe the surgery, which honestly was, was one of the coolest experiences I've had. Um, but also there was a lot of shit that I wasn't expecting. Like it was like a fucking mechanic in there. I, I, like I was expecting right. him to be way more careful <laughs> yeah. than they were. There's and a lot it, less finesse. No, when you I mean, see just it like real. what the fuck? Like, yeah, I mean, they're using yeah. like tools I have in my garage. They're right. just all stainless and, and sterile, but doing the same shit with it. I'm just like, holy fuck! No wonder you're so goddamn sore afterwards. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's a long fucking story with the uh, with the catheter. But but basically, we <laughs> fucked him over with a catheter unnecessarily. Um, <clears throat> what's your favorite whippersnapper story? As Whip far as like. Uh, you being the older guy and, and clowning, you know, a kid half your age in, a, in the unit, like, uh, hmm, favorite whippersnapper, like, like showing them up. That's, uh, you know, just not too long ago, I, I had one actually. So, just uh, a year ago, um, I like as, uh, I'm, I am the SWAT physician for Central Texas Regional SWAT, and uh, as such, I'm not. I'm not really required to anything to do anything other than set policy and kind of make sure my medics are trained up, make sure the operators are trained up and they're carrying the right stuff in their IFAC. But I still get out there and I go to the range with them and I do all the stuff and they have a, a, a physical fitness test we have to do every year. And uh, I went uh, the day that we were supposed to do it. You have three minutes to do it. It's basically an obstacle course that ends with you putting a tourniquet uh, on a mannequin on a weighted mannequin and then dragging it 
to another position doing a reevaluation, that's when your time stops. And you have three minutes to do it. I did it in two minutes and 46 seconds. So I said, okay, uh, for, for my medics that didn't do it quite as fast and who are 20, 30 years younger than me, I said, I know you're already feeling bad, but just to add to this, <laughs> I did deadlift and squats yesterday and two hours of jujitsu last night. And I have a hernia. Yeah, and, and, and I have four herniated discs in my back, yeah. and I still did it faster than That's you. That's fucking great. <laughs> what, uh, are, are most of the guys on SWAT in their tw in 20s, 30s? 30s, 30s. yeah. Th 30s is actually, in my opinion, is, is, is a really good uh, time period to kind of do something like that because I think you're in an athletic peak, yeah. And you've also, uh, your, your brain is fully matured. You know, you think about some of the stupid things we did as, as yeah. teens and 20 something, you've kind of matured past that. Yeah. You got a little bit of experience under your belt. And yeah. I, I kind of, I always tell people, you know, guys who are like early twenties who are eyeing something like that. Yeah. I'm like, get a little bit more seasoned yeah. first. I never did anything stupid at that age. Never? Yeah, never. Not once. <laughs> <laughs> no, not a single fucking thing. Uh, what's the craziest thing you've seen in an ER and uh, have you have you have you or did you see anything that made you reconsider your career choice in, in there? Uh, not reconsider emergency medicine because it, it's still. Well, I could tell a story about kind of cumulatively. I've been. I, I like to say that I didn't leave emergency medicine. Emergency medicine left me because it's becoming less about emergencies and more about kind of just being convenient drive-through medicine. Uh, which is a whole, we could do a whole podcast just talking about that. Uh, most of the crazy stuff that I've seen, um, saw a, a schizophrenic guy set him, douse himself in gasoline and set himself on fire. In the fucking ER? Not in the ER, but he, oh, I, I mean, he, he right, still heat coming off of him, still steam coming off of him. It was from a, we knew when they said where the, the ambulance was responding, we knew right where it was. Like it was right near Holy the ER. So was I mean, it was conscious? still, still fresh. No, he was, you know, thankfully, Thankfully, you know, he, he was unconscious. So that, that was pretty crazy. I've seen some pretty crazy traumas and uh, people sticking some pretty crazy shit up their ass. Yeah, what's the craziest thing you've seen shoved up somebody's ass? So uh, Not in a porn. So for some reason, glass bottles are fairly popular. Yeah. And it's uh, <clears throat> from a physics standpoint point of view you can understand why that's a bad idea because it creates <laughs> a point vacuum. of no return too it, it creates a <laughs> vacuum effect that's why I, I tell people all the time it's funny uh when we started the covid lockdown i i predicted i said we're going to have more people coming into the er because people are going to be home and bored <laughs> and more people are going to start shoving stuff up their butt and sure enough that's what happened we had a, uh, a guy come in uh lost control of a of a vibrator that was still on Jesus. So if you were really quiet in the room, you could hear it. God damn. Yeah. So, and he ultimately, he had to go to surgery. We couldn't, wow. couldn't retrieve it. So Holy fuck. So make an incision and, and go in and get it. So I always tell people, you know. Put a lanyard on it. Put a, put a safety <laughs> lanyard. It's all about the safety lanyard, right? Whether you're you know, in a car, it's a safety belt. In a helicopter, yeah. it's your monkey tail. <laughs> if it's shoving something up your ass, safety lanyard. Yeah. Is there anything that's like. Just totally random that was sho they're like how, how what, what would you even get the idea to shove this up your ass? Um, there's I didn't see it personally, but in the ER where I worked, we had the uh, we had a broom handle, <laughs> or no, I'm sorry, a mop handle, and it was uh, I was in the shower in the barracks and I just slipped. Yeah, no, I can see. Yeah, that. and somehow that <laughs> mop handle that was leaning up against the wall that's yeah probably at about four feet. You yeah. slipped and went through the air and came down on that mop yeah. handle. When, when shit like that happens, are you guys like texting each other pictures of shit and like, I know you're, I, I know you're not supposed to do that, but not with patient identifying information ever under any circumstances, because yeah, that would be a HIPAA violation. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It would. I'd like to take a quick second uh, to shout out and thank our sponsor for today's podcast, Origin Labs and Jocko Fuel. Jocko Fuel is a great product. Uh, he's got a ton of products actually within the Jocko Fuel line. Uh, the guests and I enjoy them on the show. And outside, I take a lot of the supplements. Uh, I've got some of the Origin Lab jeans, uh, boots, geese, and uh, it's just all around American industry. Uh, they do a fantastic job really re-revolutionizing American industry from start to finish. It's all American made, uh, all American sourced. Everything start to finish is made right there in-house, and they really do a phenomenal job creating the products and fulfilling the whole ball of wax. They've been a huge supporter of the Mic Drop podcast for a while now, 
And I really can't thank Jocko Fuel and Origin Labs enough for the job that they do for us. And so thank you to you guys. I'd also like to talk about uh, my brand of dog food that just came out. What are the two key components for canine success? That's effective training and proper nutrition. Fueled by Team Dog brings those two components to your family and best friend. The perfect nutritional balance that results in a higher mental acuity, energy, overall vitality, and even an improved appearance. Every product you will find in my company's store was born from the battlefield and not from the boardroom. Let my life's work help you become your dog's hero. Um, all right, so moving along, I guess, from uh, <laughs> shoved, shoving things up your ass, what, what is your morning routine? My morning routine, uh, very, very first thing I do every morning, and, I, and you know this because you've read the book, is I drink 16 ounces of water. That's, that's the very first thing I do. What I am curious about that, do you pace yourself or do you fucking slam it? Um, it depends on how I feel that morning. Some mornings it's, uh, go to a sitting position and just upend it and it's all at once. Other mornings it's, uh, drink half. Now I'm going to get up. I'm going to walk in, turn on the lights in the, in the bathroom, drink the rest of it while I'm getting ready, while I'm running the water, get ready to brush my teeth. Um, I usually don't let myself leave the master suite area until it's, until it's done. Yeah. So I'm either in my bedroom or in the, in the bathroom, uh, yeah. off the bedroom when I'm drinking it. Is there any concern I mean, I've read, and, and I know a lot of things specifically with nutrition, but um, that you talk about in the book, I mean, there's, you fucking research it on online or, or wherever. I mean, you can find data that backs mm -hmm. up every fucking point and you can find data that contradicts disputes it or contradicts yep, every, every fucking point. I, I have seen, you know, in, in more than one occasion, you know, slamming water as you, in terms of your body not being able to, uh, you know, to really use it properly. If you drink it faster than a certain pace, do you do you think that think or feel that there's any validity to that? Um, I think there there is to a point. If I, I think in the amount that I'm doing it, 16 ounces, I don't think there's ever anything that's shown that there's a problem that way. When you start getting up to uh, Guy, like you're, there used to be that guy who was on the on the man show that he could do like a whole uh, stein of beer in like yeah. one shot. If you were doing water like that, you can get something that's called water intoxication, yeah. which basically is severe uh, hyponatremia. You've diluted the salt in your body so much that you can start to have seizures and other things. Yeah. But we um, had, we had uh, my first deployment. Actually, we had two two of our platoon mates. Uh, had a water drinking contest. We were in Dubai at a at a port doing like port security shit. Right. This is right after the coal got bombed, and uh, and yeah, they, they got all fucked up. You know, I mean, yeah. they drank like probably almost two gallons of water like in an hour, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, both of them. It was like they were drunk, and I know that can throw your electrolytes and fuck Way your off. equilibrium off, and it, it can mean shit. It can kill you. But yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, that's some of those not dumb things that we did in our fucking early days. Right. Well, there was a, I don't know if you if you remember it, this was back, I don't know how many years ago, there was a, some radio station that did a thing, it was to win concert tickets. Yeah. They had like 10 people in the room, and that's, uh, you can't get up and go to the bathroom, and yeah. whenever we tell you to drink, you got to drink. Yeah. And they were doing that, and people were calling in, going, hey man, you know, this is like a real issue, and, yeah. the, and the DJ was going, oh, that's all right, they all signed a, a waiver, <laughs> and was hanging up on these people. And sure enough, this one lady ended up having a seizure right, <laughs> oh, shit. right there in the studio yeah, in God front damn. of everybody. So, wow. um, yeah, I think with, okay. and I talk, again, I talk, you know, the logic behind it in the book that, you know, you, you're basically dehydrating all night long. So yeah. I, I want to get ahead of that. Yeah. Um, and it, I've noticed a difference in it. Could I probably nurse it throughout the morning? Yes, but I like for it to be that a block that I that I basically I check and, yeah. and it's done. So yeah. no, I'm tracking. Yeah, it's that uh, dogs out, alarm off, uh, breakfast, coffee, feeding the dogs, and then uh, and then usually emails until I go to the gym. Yeah, what uh, do you get up super early? I don't. So I um, I hate alarm clocks and. Uh, like you, I've spent a, a huge portion of my life in a sleep sleep deficit, and I don't like to live there anymore. So uh, I don't even, on a typical day, unless like today, unless I have somewhere to be, I won't set an alarm clock. No. And I find myself getting out of bed, you know, before 8 pretty much every morning. Yeah. Um, I'm not the best sleeper, so to kind of get a full block of sleep, I do that. Um, 
But no, I'm not, I'm not a, like, I don't know, like Jocko, I don't know how he does it. You yeah. know, going to bed at 11, getting up at 4.30, but that suits him. It doesn't yeah. happen to suit me. Yeah. Um, so it, whenever I can get away with not setting an alarm, I don't set an alarm. Yeah, I got you. I, I'm the same way. I, I, I don't set one if I don't need to. Uh, and most mornings I'm up by 7 anyway on my own. But, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm tracking. Uh, in terms of, of what you eat, you talk a lot about in the book, and we'll get into some of that, but is there a typical breakfast that you eat? Um. I recently transitioned. Typically, I, I was doing just like a, a power bar of some kind. I actually like. I'm not. I'm not on a low carb or an Adkins diet, but the Adkins meal bars I like just because they're not all sugar. Because I found if I eat something that's just mostly carbohydrates, I just burn through it like nobody's business. Yeah. Um, so I'll eat something like that. Uh, but again, recently I transitioned to doing uh, yogurt, uh, Greek yogurt with uh, uh, granola mixed in with it just because yeah. I feel like it's a little bit more substantial. And uh, I don't take a, I'm currently not taking a probiotic, so I like taking it just for digestive health, yeah, too. Yeah, I got you. Well, good shit. Um, all right, so in terms of uh, kind of your early childhood and what set you up to, to go into the Army and, and take the career path that you did, uh, walk us through that, kind of where, where you're from and, and what your childhood was like. I was, uh, I was born in Redondo Beach, California. Oh, shit. So, yeah. California guy. <laughs> of course, California wasn't California back then, but... No, it was, it was a different California, yeah. right? It was not... It wasn't Gavin Newsom's California. Yeah. It, was, it was the Beach Boys California back then. So, I, you know, I was born in 66. Spent uh, most... You know, the 60s and 70s in the, in the South Bay area. We kind of... We bounced around between Redondo, Hermosa. I lived in Inglewood for a while. Lived in Lawndale for a while. And then spent my formative years in a place called Tehachapi, which is a little mountain town. Yeah, yeah, most people don't. Yeah. <laughs> so usually when I say that, yeah. they don't, yeah, it's I, completely I know right alien. Where it is. Yeah. yeah, very few people do. It's a cool area. Yeah, really cool area. Small town, uh, one red light in the whole town, and it it wasn't a full traffic light. It was just a blinking red light. Yeah, it was the you would say to people, "We'll meet at the four way." Yeah, because there was only four one <laughs> four way stop in the whole town. Yeah, so it's like we'll meet at the, in the four way was right by. The railroad tracks and had a vacant parking lot next to it, so that's where everybody would meet on like a Friday or Saturday night was yeah. at the four way. Yeah, uh, that's where I spent my formative years. Uh, my parents were hippies. Um, spent a little bit of time in the early seventies that we actually lived in a commune uh, right outside of Yosemite. <laughs> oh, <shit. laughs> yeah, that was. We didn't. Uh, I just remember the food was not to my liking. Uh, that's, that's all I really great. remember about it. And, that uh, explains the granola in your yogurt. Yeah, and I learned how to macrame, so <laughs> I got that going for me as a fallback plan if I ever need it. Most people are people are googling macrame yeah. right now because oh, they don't shit. know what the hell that the fuck is. Fuck is that? Uh, had a typical uh, working class upbringing in Tatchby. Played played football. Uh, I, I I was terrible at any any sport that required a high degree of coordination or finesse. But things where you just run and knock people over, I was pretty yeah. good at. Yeah. Um, then uh, decided at some point, actually, when I was still in high school, this was the 80s, and it was kind of cool to be patriotic again, and uh, started talking to military recruiters and was really drawn to the whole idea of jumping out of airplanes and doing something really cool and wear, wearing a cool hat and, and putting camo on my face and, yeah. and do, being a part of something larger than myself. So that's kind of what drew me to the, the military lifestyle, which... Was there any any family members, uncles, cousins, or anything like that that, that served? Or uh, my dad and uh, my dad, all of his brothers except for one, uh, and his dad. So going back two generations, were all Navy actually. Really? Yeah. So my dad was on the Bennington, uh, which is a it is a target somewhere floating in the ocean somewhere yeah. today. Um, yeah, all a lot of Navy in my family. Yeah. Nobody that had ever done career. Everybody, yeah. even whether they'd volunteered or been drafted, it had been. Yeah, you know, I'm going to do one, one and done, and yeah. I'm going to get out. Yeah. What uh, What was the transition like uh, in high school from kind of when you made that decision, and and uh, and I guess was there like a a light switch moment that like, hey, this is what I'm going to do, and, and it kind of came to you, or was it a gradual decision, or like, was there a turning point? Um, I think it was a gradual decision. It was something that I'd always pondered quite a bit, and then uh, kind of a, a pivotal time for me is. Uh, my best friend growing up was a guy named uh, Brian Edwards, who ultimately, he just retired a few years ago. He was the uh, Sergeant Major of Special Forces Command when he retired. Oh, shit. And uh, he was also my- Also from Tatchby. Also from Tatchby. So he was a year older than me. Brian and I were best friends growing up. And we started 
looking into this, started, you know, looking, reading books on it and, you know, watched back then your only frame of reference was John Wayne's, the green berets, yeah. right? Um, talking to the recruiter, you know, finding people, you know, we'd be out in public somewhere and see some guy with a short haircut looked like he might be, Hey, are you in the military? What do you do? You know, talking to him about it. And we decided this was, you know, this was our out. We're going to get out of this town. We're going to go do something cool. We're going to be flying around the, flying around the world and, in aircraft and jumping out of them in the middle of the night yeah. and doing all this uh, crazy stuff. And like I say, he graduated a year ahead of me. He went directly into special forces. He was the last year that you could do that. And then when it came time for me to sign up, uh, I got a Ranger contract, which in retrospect was absolutely the best thing for me. Yeah. Cause going directly to SF without time to mature and kind of, uh, get beat down a little bit through kind of a, a pecking order yeah. uh, just wouldn't have been the right move for me. So, so you came in right out of high school, right at two weeks out of high school. Yeah. I shipped off. Yeah. yeah. All right. So you go to, uh, did you go to Fort Bragg right away for boot camp and all I, that? I went to Benning uh, for, for, for boot camp and AIT and airborne school. And then uh, to Savannah for, at the time it was still the Ranger indoctrination program yeah. and it was run at the individual battalions. That was right before they consolidated it into <clears> one at Benning. So I went to RIP there, and then I was in 1st Ranger Battalion in Savannah for okay. four years. This was what, like 88? 84. Oh, 84. Okay. Yeah. That's right. Uh, I did the math the wrong way two years. <laughs> My dumb ass. Um, at, so at that time, uh, like Breakfast Club is popular. You yeah. Know, like, oh, yeah. Uh, kind of the height of the 80s while I'm growing up watching fucking Rambo and, and shit like that. Was there any impact that any of that had on uh, on you uh, seeing shit like that or or i know for me and, and the generation of guys kind of my age um, that was a huge part of yeah growing up and and inspiring i know you mentioned you know john wayne being kind of the only thing that was out there but even as you're in i know like when i was going through seal training gi jane came out and like we all went and right. watched it and threw shit at the screen and yeah. fucking heckled uh, everybody and, and pissed everybody off. But uh, was there any of that kind of like almost influence as you're going through seeing some of this pop culture start to, to come up? You know, I don't think as a, as a direct influence, and I'm trying to remember uh, what year First Blood came out. I want to say, I mean, it was early 80s. I yeah, guess. it was definitely early 80s because I, I know that um, the sequel came out, I think, towards the end of my time in, in Ranger Battalion. So I guess... First Blood must have come out when I was still in high school, probably in my senior yeah. year. But I, at that point, I'd already I'd already made that decision, so yeah. I, I knew that I was going to be doing something yeah. like that. Um, you know, it's funny because just uh, two nights ago, uh, I was telling my wife that one of the one of the the two films that I remember from my my time in that initial four years on active duty that kind of made an impact on me. Uh, one was Platoon. So, you know, I'll, I'll always remember that one just because of kind of the rawness and the realness of that. But uh, Aliens. No shit. Yeah. So a Alien, the Colonial Marines and Aliens, that was probably the most quoted military film that I remember. And it was all of Paxton's lines, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, stick a fork at us, we're done. You know, game <laughs> over, man. That was, it, it's, we were constantly quoting that in Ranger Battalion. That's funny. And uh, it's, there, there's so much about that movie that when when you're watching it, it's uh, you kind of you, you feel it like when the, when they're in the APC, that reminds me of, of you know so many times you know in the back of a Chinook or yeah. in the back of an MRAP. It's uh, it's the the feel of what it's like that you know kind of gearing up and of course you know the one guy Michael <coughs> Byan's character sleeping through the whole thing because you always got that yeah. guy who's yeah. I'm just gonna sleep. You know, yeah. Let me let me know when we're two minutes out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's some good shit. The uh, all right, so you're going through um, you go through RIP, Ranger Indoctrination Program. You went to a, a battalion, and did you have to wait a while to go to Ranger School, or did you go fairly quick? Uh, I went. Uh, I was about six to eight months oh, no after shit. I was there. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I, I guess overall, what what did you think of uh, of the Ranger Battalion experience? Like, how, how would you synopsize that? Uh, I think it's. I think it's an ideal experience for a late teens, early 20 male with a lot of motivation, not a lot of wisdom, uh, <laughs> and not a lot of direction yeah. because it's structured. And, you know, there's a neat, uh, the, the, you know, I talked about the pecking order. You know, you have, you get there, you're a brand new private. 
the guy who was the brand new private the day before you got there is relieved when you walk in because you're taking some of the heat. Yeah. He also is going to be mentoring you a little bit. And, you know, the, the, the E4 who's above him is mentoring him. And then the E5 above that E4 is mentoring everyone. So you have this, this, this mentorship program that you're, you're growing your own leadership as you go and teaching each other the ropes and, you know, the, the, the simple things like, you know, how to get in and out of your rucksack at night without being that dickhead who's making a lot of noise and compromised us. Yeah. Um, that you learn that you're learning from the people who maybe got there six months before you did. Yeah. And you're passing that knowledge <clears throat> down. So I think it was a it was a great place to 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 kind of grow up yeah. as a as a as a young pup in the military and, and learn the ropes and get given you know, they, they parcel out a little bit more responsibility as you show you're able to handle that responsibility. And, and ultimately, uh, a, you know, a junior, I was a, a gun team leader before I went to ranger school, even yeah. I was a gun team leader. So I was, you know, that meant being responsible for, for two other guys who were essentially my peers. You know, mm -hmm. we, we got there at the same time. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you really learn to appreciate that and, and the structure and, not not what to think, but how to approach problems and how to think. And I think it was really helpful for me uh, in a lot of aspects of my life moving yeah. forward, not just militarily. Yeah, uh, yeah, I've I've known quite a few of them, and uh, and it all seems to be a pretty pretty similar experience that way. It's it's a neat neat program, no doubt about it. Uh, so you go from there, uh, and you were there for about four years, and then you made the switch over to uh, SF. I got uh, initially I ETS after my first uh, enlistment. And I was I went to to 20th Group in the Florida National Guard, and my plan was um, I'm going to get a degree, and then I'm going to go into some type of federal law enforcement, whether that's Secret Service or DEA. I hadn't really decided yet, and uh, that was my plan when I got out in '88. And then uh, we ended up getting mobilized for Desert Storm, Desert Shield in '91, and. That's when I got thrown into special forces selection. I say thrown in because literally what happened is <clears throat> typically in 20th group, you'd get a train up period and then they would kind of certify you as, okay, you're ready to go. You're not going to embarrass us. You can go ahead and go. But when we got, uh, arrived at Fort Bragg uh, during this time frame, the selection classes had nobody in them because everybody was off fighting a war. Oh, no shit. So they said, uh, the, the liaison over at the schoolhouse said, hey, we got as many guys as you can send us we can put them in class. Like yeah. we're, you know, we're, we're running half and, and smaller class sizes. So they came in, we'd been on brag like two days and they said, uh, everybody get all your gear and be down on the street. There's going to be a cattle truck's going to come pick you up. <laughs> and we're like, where are we going? You're going to selection. Oh, when tomorrow. Oh shit. Okay. Wow. So, uh, and <clears throat> I had been a, a college student just a couple days before I didn't have, I hadn't done a road march in a couple of months. I'm um, like, well, I guess I'll just figure this out as I go, which yeah. is basically what I did. Yeah. And, uh, but going through selection and then subsequently going through uh, the SF qualification course, I realized, man, I've, I've really missed there's so much about the military to dislike, but there's so much that I've missed too. Yeah. You know, getting, waking up every day and having a challenge in front of me, you know, whether, you know, that's a physical challenge or a mental challenge, being part of something larger than myself, the, the camaraderie, because I was obviously in college, I wasn't. I wasn't in a fraternity, or anything. You know, there was yeah. none of my classmates. I didn't even associate with my classmates outside yeah. of class. I was working as a corrections officer at night. I didn't have a lot in common with with those guys. Yeah. Um, certainly wasn't going to hang out with the inmates when they got out. But uh, I, I had missed all that. You know, being a part of something like that. And, I'm, and I said, you know, I'm not going to. When everybody else demobilize and go back home, I'm just going to stay on active duty, which yeah. is what I did. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the military, I think, is, is a, a unique and cool experience that way because most jobs are, are pretty predictable, you know, whereas it's not in the yeah. military. I mean, li life isn't predictable, but, you know, most jobs, like, you go and you do the same fucking thing every day, you know, and whatever, and and that gets boring, and it, it doesn't feel like there's a lot of purpose and, and reason behind you're doing what you're doing, and it's easy to b become depressed or miserable or whatever, and to me, that's one of the neatest things about the military, especially at that age, is that it gives you more direction than you even know what to fucking do with. You know, most yeah. of the time is that like you, you don't have the 
the shitty luxury or ability to, to really worry about what you're going to do or, you know, being bored or, you know, like it's a good distraction, uh, you know, and, and some people may, may hear that and think that that sounds kind of shitty, but, you know, I think people need, they need some, a target to focus on, you know, and, and it yep. gives you a, a good healthy one that, that makes you feel like you're doing, doing something. Even if you're sweeping the beach or fucking painting lines in the parking lot or picking up trash, I mean, like yeah. it's still the way that it's Raking structured and, and yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. like those are all auxiliary things, but the, you know, the things that you're actually training for, you know, gives you a, a good sense of purpose, which uh, I, I think, um, you know, I'm curious, I guess, from a doctor's standpoint, like, I think that's one of the biggest things that, that people have an issue with when they leave is, is the lack of that, is that not a lot of direction, not, not camaraderie, you know, yeah. sense of camaraderie with, with wherever they're at, uh, you know, and, and that, that feeling of, of making a difference or at least some sort of purposeful being, I think, uh, is where a lot of guys have a hard time with it. You lose a lot of the external motivators. Yeah. You lose, you lose the peer pressure, you, you lose the kind of the tribe aspect of it. Yeah. And you also don't have, you know, whoever it is up here, you know, the command or whatever saying you guys will, you know, this physical assessment has to be done yeah. twice a year. This uh, you have this endurance event coming up or this deployment coming up yeah. that you better train for. Or when you get there, you're going to fail miserably. Yeah. And uh, consequences will be accordingly. Yeah. Yeah. Beatings will continue. Beatings will continue until, until morale, morale improves. <laughs> Uh, all right, so you go you go into selection. I'm assuming you made it through first first go at it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where did you go from there? So uh, I went through went through SFAS and uh, then went less than a month later. Uh, I was in uh, in SFQC in in the Q course. Typically, at that time, most people in the big army they would go to selection, go back to their unit. And then get orders to out process. So you, it, for them, it was probably might have been you know four to six months before they transitioned. But we were right there, so yeah. it was like we're going to give you a couple of weeks for your feet to heal, basically, and then we're yeah. going to we're going to throw you back in there. Um, did the engineer course? Uh, did language school immediately after? What uh, what language? Uh, Spanish. Spanish. And uh, had had already decided at that point I wanted to stay on active duty. So went over and talked to the seventh group sergeant major. And uh, got a job lined up because uh, seventh, seventh, twentieth group and seventh group were were operationally aligned at the time, and uh, still are, I believe. Um, talked to him about a job. He said, "Yeah, absolutely." I had to retake the uh, the ASVAB test because <laughs> of the dates of my ASVAB. Like they're like, yeah. "Oh, you're just yeah. too long." The, yeah. You know, at that time, it, that's what she said. It's like, yeah, he's like, "You're just too long." <laughs> You had like eight years or something like that. So I had to go retake the ASVAB. I actually did better uh, and then uh, went through the reception station again and uh, got a contract, went back to Bragg, uh, went to uh, 1st Battalion, 7th Special Forces Group yeah, and uh, did that again for uh, a <coughs> little over three years as a demo guy and then decided seeing the medics in the company and what they were allowed to do and the the level of respect that they got and that they were just absolute masters of their craft. I'm like, you know, I really, I want that mental challenge. I want to try that. What, so, what was the year period or the time frame? That you this were was, uh, so I got, I went through selection, the Q course in 91, and then I got to seventh group, I guess, 90, late 91. And then I, and that as an engineer, and then I went to the medic course. I signed out a group end of 94 and took Christmas leave and route, and then uh, started uh, the medic course in '95. Okay, uh, so I'm assuming you missed the first Gulf War window completely. Yeah, we we mobilized, went up to Fort Bragg, and then as soon as we got there, they said, uh, "Okay, you guys are not deploying. The purpose of you mobilizing is for us to validate the reservist SF model." Yeah, and so what they ended up doing was uh, putting putting teams through. Um, like a certification and an endurance event uh, that happened like a few months later. And I wasn't qualified at the time. So I went to SFAS first and then came back and I was a, I was a, an LNO for one of the teams that was going through that evaluate that ex eval at the time. Yeah. Um, but no, nobody, uh, nobody got on a plane, went, you know, went anywhere. Yeah. We just went to brag. So it was Somalia happening during that same window. Uh, was there ever the idea or notion that you guys might go there or, or did you, or, not in seventh group. Uh, there was, we did almost, my, uh, my ODA in particular almost went to Bosnia. Oh, okay. And uh, what ended up happening, 
was they had, uh, because it was a multinational force, they had an Argentinian infantry battalion that they wanted to get, to go over and do a do a tour for right, six to nine months. And they said, okay, so what these guys are going to need is they're going to need uh, liaisons with radios to coordinate with other units and also, and most especially, to coordinate their air support. So we did a, like a six-month train-up. I went out to Red Flag out at Vegas twice, calling in fast movers and, and bomb strikes and A-10s and everything, learning all the lingo and how to run... Uh, uh, laser target designators and everything else. And that yeah. was my job was going to be to basically walk next to an Argentinian company commander. And if he needed air support, I would basically be his fac. Oh, okay. Call in the air support. And then uh, we waited around for months for that to happen. And then ultimately it didn't happen. Yeah. So. Um, I mean, that's fucking typical, uh, the, the luck and timing of the military. Uh, so once you switched over to uh, to the medical course, uh, how long is that? Like eight, like eighteen Delta medical course, or yeah. So that was uh, long. <laughs> it That's was eighteen months, right? Yeah, it was. Uh, it was at Fort Sam. We're at Fort Sam, I think, for nine, and that was when it was still split in two locations, and then uh, and then came back to Bragg uh, for the med lab portion yeah. of it. Yeah. Uh, do you think any of the uh, Army installation bases should be renamed because of uh, them being? You know, I I, underst I understand the argument behind it. I got to tell you, I don't. I don't get it. Yeah, I, I don't. I, I, I guess I should just say, I, I see where they're coming from. I, I see where kind of the inception of the idea comes from. Um, <clears throat> and it's one of those things that I've kind of had to take a step back and say, all right, you know, just because this isn't a big deal to me, doesn't mean it's not a big deal to somebody else. Yeah. Now, I also see the argument, okay, out of all the shit we need to worry about with military readiness, does this really need to be a priority? You know, with, with yeah. all the, with, with active duty suicides being the highest they've ever been this year. Opioid addiction. Opioid addiction. Uh, God, Fort, Fort Hood has a be on the lookout like every other week for somebody wandering off a post. Um, with all the other issues, does this really need to be this big high profile issue? I don't know. It's, it's also, it's, it's kind of one of those things too, that I, I'm not emotionally invested in it either way. So I don't give it a lot of thought. It's and even, even closer to home in, in, in Georgetown, Texas, we have a Confederate statue on the town square. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't know we had a Confederate statue on the town square, even though I'd been to the town square multiple times until there was a posting on it uh, in a Facebook group about, oh, a bunch of people want to tear down the statue, so we need to have a counter protest. And I'm like, we have a Confederate statue? And they're like, yeah, that, that big statue. Right? And I said, I just thought it was some guy. Like I never, I never went up and read the plaque. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't really care. It's not a statue of anybody in my family. I don't really care one way or another. I've talked to people on both sides of the issue. Um, I'm just not emotionally invested in it. Yeah. And I think this is the same with the post renaming, you know, you know, Hood, Bragg, all, all these other posts that were named after Confederate generals. There's a bunch of forts too, like Pickett and yep. Lee and, you know, all the, all the fucking, a, a bunch of them in the, in the Southeast coast. Yeah. I mean, here's my take on it is that, you know, not, I would say similarly, like I don't give a shit either way. The problem that I have is that when you start doing things because it hurts people's feelings, then where mm -hmm. does that end? Because I could just as easily say, I'm offended by you wanting to take it down. Right. So we're even now. Right. Right. Like, why, why does your outrage outweigh mine? Right. Like, it shouldn't. Right. You know, so to me, like, it, it's all or nothing. Like, you either you either bend to everybody and say, hey, that couch offends me. Hey, I don't like the color of that building. It makes me feel, you know, violated so you have to repaint that like well, it's you know so where, where do you draw that fucking line if you look right here right here in texas so i was on briefly on lyndon b johnson parkway mm -hmm. coming over here he was a racist <laughs> he was a homophobe yeah there's a uh he picked up his dogs by the ears yeah <laughs> you know he did a lot of shit that you know that people would be offended are we just no and you're absolutely right is where do you draw the line yeah i mean to me that the, the point is that you can't yeah. You know, th there is nowhere that you can draw that line because it's always going to be drawn by somebody that that is going to, to be disagreed by somebody else, mm -hmm. you know, and so that's not far enough or that's too far or whatever. And so, you know, to me, it, it's either 
a society where anytime somebody's feelings hurt, the entire society has to bend to that person, which is obviously not realistic, or everybody can throw their fucking big boy pants on and just not fucking worry about shit. You yeah. know, I don't know. I mean, to, to me, like, I, I don't know why that's difficult, but yeah, no. And I see it's, uh, it is a little bit the, 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 and I don't, I don't know the impetus, you know, back when they named all these installations, I don't know if somebody was like, all right, we're going to, we're going to show those Yankees. We're going to call this Ford hood. I, I don't know what the thought process was. Yeah. I do know that, you know, when, when it comes to some of the Confederate statues and some of the states that changed their flags to the Confederate battle flag, that a lot of that was reactionary to desegregation in the 1960s. And that was a little bit of an FU to Washington. Like, yeah. okay, we're, yeah, we're going to do it, but we're going to show you we don't like it. Yeah. So, yeah. I, it's, I mean, I guess, <laughs> you know, again, to me, like you, you could – any group of people could make that argument about anything, about anything. that's yeah. any flag that has what representation. I mean, pick any fucking flag. Like yeah. you could find a group that's pissed made about off that about. flag. Yeah. I mean, I mean you know. so that's what I mean. It's like at some point, you know, and I, and I think not only are we there, I think we've lunged over that fucking line mm -hmm. of, of ridiculousness where it just, it just doesn't even fucking make sense anymore, you know, and, and people can't see the forest for the trees. And I've said this on a, on a multitude of shows, uh, here lately and i talk about it and i've got a new book coming out too that doesn't have shit to do with dogs or the military it's it's a political book called unfuck america nice uh it, it comes out november 16th it's available for pre-order on kindle on amazon right mm -hmm. now but um at any rate the uh you know i talk you know to a certain extent about that is that you know there's just there there um you know comes a point where um you know we've we've done so many things as uh, you know, reactions to somebody else's feelings that, that it becomes impossible to do anything, you yeah. know, and, and we lose our, uh, you know, our, our personality as a, as a society, as a nation, as a country, as a people, uh, you know, and I think we're, we're past that, you know, and, and you can't uh, bend and, and bow to every, every person or group's demands that, so, you know, something needs to change because it makes us feel this way. I just, I think it's fucking poisonous. Yeah. But. And if you want to talk about if we're going to tear down monuments to, to slavery, there's three really big ones in Egypt Yeah, that you yeah. Know, get your hammers out because, yeah. you know, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, so, I mean, you know, yeah, globally, like it's a whole, whole nother thing. I mean, there, there's a group of people that, that I have no doubt would view um, Arlington that way, you know, yeah. or, you know, there's it's, take Europe, you know, like if you, if you go to Normandy, like there's, there's probably, some people that think that that's a big fuck you to them that, you know, the people that lost world war II, you know? Um, and, and I just, I just don't understand, you know, why people are, are so bent on that. I do think that there is a, a significant component that exists where, you know, we, we essentially as a society are so technologically advanced and successful that we have the luxury to worry about dumb shit like First that, world problems. you know, exactly. Uh, I mean, and it, I think it, it really highlights that is that, you know, if you go to other, other places on the planet right fucking now, they don't give a flying fuck about any of those things because they, they don't have the luxury to, to worry about shit like that. They're, they're worried about the primary necessities, you know, and uh, not that I'm saying I wish our society was in that tough of a spot, but I do think that a happy medium exists of, uh, of just, you know, leaving things the fuck alone. And, and uh, if you don't like something, don't fucking look at it. Uh, mm -hmm. That's my take, but. Anyway, I don't want to get too too off kilter. We'll get back into politics here as uh, as we move on. But um, but just in hearing you say all these different, you know, uh, fort this, fort that, and, and what have you, I, I, I was curious. But um, all right, so you, you make it all the way through medical school, uh, or you know, you're essentially a PA at that point, right? I mean, basically, as an 18 Delta, yeah, yeah. PAs really don't like it when we say that. But. Well. But, I, so I don't, I don't the, care about their that's, feelings either. That's the famous 18 Delta line is I'm essentially a PA. Yeah. yeah. No, no PA says I'm, a, I'm essentially an 18 Delta guy. The 18 Delta guys. Yeah. Um, so, all right. So either way, I mean, you're, you're more than just a paramedic by quite yeah. a bit. Yeah. Um, you know, so you're, you're kind of between a paramedic and a doctor. Uh, we'll, we'll call it that. Is that a fair? Sure. That's absolutely fair. fair and accurate. Yeah. Um, all right. So from that point, what does your career look like? Uh, so, it was actually right around, uh, I was in the medical school application process uh, when 9-11 happened. And in fact, I had already done some of my interviews at that time. 
and I considered not going to medical school because yeah, I was like, well, we're going we're gonna to be at war. And my company sergeant major actually pulled me aside and he said, look, we're seventh group. We're not fifth group. We're not 10th group. We're not even third group. He said, I can tell you right now, we are going to be dead last on the rotation for this. Why, uh, why is that? Why is there such preference for the other groups? Just, just because of area of orientation. You know, if, if it, to, to put it, to spin it a different way. So if let's say um, 9-11 had been per- perpetrated by members of the FARC out of Columbia, Seventh group gets first pop at that, right? So we're we're already tuned in. We are, you know, we already know the players. We already know the names. We already know the the history. We know what their order of battle is, yeah. Right. Um, It just makes the most sense for us to go first. And and the 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 Cold War kind of thought process and the the Cold War and '90s thought process was there's always going to be enough work to do in every region of the world that we can just keep it this way divvied up. Yeah. Obviously, a two-front war in GWAT ended up being, you know, they ended up figuring out pretty quick. Yeah. We can't burn out the fifth group guys and the tenth group guys and even the third group guys. It's yeah. just too many trips. And so seventh group gets to take a bite too, yeah. which is what everybody wanted. But he, the writing was on the wall that he could see that I hadn't seen yet, which is we're not going anywhere for a while. Yeah. He said it's going to be years. He said, he said two things. It's going to be years before we go. And it's going to be years that we're involved in this. So that war is not going anywhere. Mm. And he said, so I think what you would end up doing is needlessly delaying med school when really what you need to be doing is get to med school, get your training, get back here because we're going to need guys like you that know what it's like to be an operator. So we don't have to train them up. You're going to show, you're going to show up ready to go on day one. You understand what we do, how we do it, and how to integrate yourself into that. So you need to go. And uh, ultimately, that was the absolute best advice because what ended up happening is I was in my third year of medical school um, and back at Bragg doing a family medicine rotation. And my company that I had left in seventh group was just getting ready to go on their first deployment. Yeah. So I would have I would have delayed medical, and I probably would have ended up not going to medical school because I had to have an age waiver, yeah, uh, to get in because I was I was uh, I matriculated at thirty six, okay, and the cutoff for uses is thirty. So. I got you. Uh, what the fuck does matriculated mean? Going to school. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that's a doctor. That's a do- an un- unnecessary yeah. big doctor word. Yeah, that's a, once a year I get to use that word matriculated. Yeah, fucking matriculated. Um, all right, so you go through all that. Is there a, really anything you can share from med school that would surprise people in terms of what it, what it's like, or you know, difficulty versus anticipated versus what it was? You know, anything like that? It's not uh, the surprising thing I think about med school that that most most people don't know is um, there's not a there is not a high attrition rate in medical school at all. It's extremely low. Really, extremely low. That is surprising. The the attrition rate is in the selection process to get there. So you. getting through your undergraduate, getting your prereqs, getting a high enough score on your MCAT, getting an interview. Generally, if you get an interview, if if you're somebody going through that process and you get an interview at more than one medical school, then you're you're probably going to get in. Yeah. And they don't want to recruit people. They don't want to have people failing out left and right. Yeah. So they, they have check blocks that they look at that if we're going to accept you, we know you can do the work. So I mean, it's, it's really no different than BUDS for SEALs or Q course for, you know, the, yes. the selection is so difficult. that that's Selection is so difficult that the actual coursework, yeah. we're confident that you, yeah. we, you've shown that you can do it yeah. through the other things that you've done, basically. Cool. I mean, that makes good sense. Um, now, it didn't feel like that my first year because <laughs> I didn't know, uh, yeah. I wasn't studying properly. I was... I was convinced, I was used to the military style of everything in that, uh, you know, in, in the military, you know, you're going through a course you, where, where you get the real key information is not in the reading material, it's from the instructor, right? Because we had the, <laughs> the foot stomp, right? Is, you know, you'd be in a class and they'd be like, you may need to know this. Yeah. Right. They did. That's okay. That's definitely going to be on the test, right? Yeah. 
in medical school, there is no foot stomping. That's actually reassuring because I, I don't want foot stomping if somebody's cutting my fucking head open. Like right, a, that the only reason he remembered <laughs> yeah. what part of the brain that was yeah, because, <laughs> because the instructor slapped the right? floor. Yeah. It, uh, lectures are totally like an afterthought in medical school. Most of the people lecturing you actually in a lot of the subjects, in the, especially in the first year, are PhDs who don't want to be they're pissed off because yeah. it's they've got something cooking in the lab upstairs they want to get back to. Yeah. But to be faculty, they occasionally have to lecture. They don't want to be there. Yeah. Most of them are ridiculously smart, so they can't explain it. It'd be like me explaining a car battery to an ant. Like yeah. I, I just I couldn't do it. That's how these PhDs are. They can't really explain it. So I figured out early on, even though they had told me, oh, you don't have to go to lectures. I was like, why would you not go to lectures? Yeah. Why do you have them then? Yeah, why do you, yeah, why bother? I figured out a few months in going to lectures is what's hurting me because I could be spending that time reading. Yeah. And I stopped going to lectures. About uh, about a third of the way through first year I stopped going to lectures. You have to go to what the, what they call labs where you're doing practical stuff, but you don't have to go to lectures. So I just started dedicating all that time to reading and my grades came up. Um, first 2 years were still, you know, I was middle of the pack pretty much the whole way through uh, the first couple of years because there's a, a lot of really challenging book work. And then uh, third and fourth year were easy to me because I'd been in 18 Delta, so I'd seen patients before. Third and fourth year, you're all doing clinicals. So you're walking in, doing a physical exam, talking to patients, getting a patient history, coming up with a plan. This is all stuff that I had done before. Prostate exams with both your hands on their Prostate shoulders. exam, yeah. Was, yeah so <laughs> all of that was, was so much easier to me. And it's like yeah. third, third and fourth year, I felt like I was just coasting through. I'm like, yeah. okay, I'm, you know, I'm playing, I'm student doctor now. I'm just yeah. playing doctor. What was the age disparity between you and the, the collective mean average of the student? I was 36 uh, as a first year. So you figure most of my classmates, you know, uh, got out of high school, did their undergraduate, and they were probably 24 or younger. Please tell, were you married at that time? Yeah. No. Yeah. I was going to say, yeah, there had to have been some hot ass that was 12, 10, 12 years younger than you that there was. I had some. It's not there, that there wasn't, but. I had some uh, some very uh, some appealing female classmates, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, was, uh, was there any insecurity on your wife's part of you going to fucking college? You're spending all day with college girls that are fucking 10 years no, young. No, I mean, this is, uh, I'm, this, marriage wise, this isn't my first rodeo. So this no. is the, the person that we're talking about is now my ex wife. I got you. Um, no, I never, is I that never, why she's your ex wife? No, no, absolutely not. <laughs> it's that we could do a whole podcast on that too. But yeah. basically, it wasn't, once I got off of an ODA and I wasn't getting on a plane and going places for six months at a time all the yeah. time and I was home all the time, I figured out, we don't belong together. Yeah, the reason we stayed married is because I was gone all the right. time. Yeah, right. I mean that seems to be the case yeah. with a lot of uh, a lot of marriages and, and relationships. And yeah, I mean in the military period, but especially in, in uh, soft groups, it's a it's a weird kind of dichotomy relationship wise that way. But yeah, uh, definitely, um, to totally different with uh, my my wife Denise and I. Um, I mean, I, I retired in 2016, and even before that, you know, I was home for long swaths of time. Yeah. And we're together every day, uh, pretty much all day, every day. We're both working from home. Yeah. And uh, I can't imagine being happier. <laughs> yeah. No, that's fun. That's awesome. Yeah. That's great to hear. Um, all right. So you, you finished uh, that. And then did you go right from there back to the uh, joint? Uh, I, f I finished uh, med school. I went to UCIS for med school. And then uh, I went to my residency, my three-year residency in emergency medicine in San Antonio. What, uh, what is UCIS? Uh, Uniform Services University of the Health Sciences. Oh shit! Where is that at? Yeah, so it's in Bethesda, Maryland. Okay. It's it's on uh, <clears throat> it's it's where uh, National Naval Medical Center is. It's I on gotcha. that same small installation. Okay. It's kind of on the back of the post there. Yeah. Um, it ended up taking up uh, a portion of their golf course, I think. Um, and it's uh, it's a medical school. It is a. Uh, there's a dual nurse practitioner program. There's one for anesthesia. And one for uh, for uh, nurse practitioner, regular nurse. There's a nurse CRNA program and a nurse practitioner program, and then I think there's a couple PhD programs that run at the university as well. Because of what you were, I mean, between being a, an 18 Delta uh, and with the plan of going back to the unit to to serve as basically a combat care doctor. I mean, I'm assuming that's the drive for doing ER. Always, yeah. yeah. 
uh, which yeah, obviously makes sense. You probably don't want to be an anesthesiologist running around, <laughs> running around radiologist, around dermatologist, yeah. <laughs> uh, physical therapist, maybe. The uh, all right. So w- once you go back to the unit, what was that like after having been in college for four years doing uh, you know heavy book work and uh, and the heavy lifting mentally it, that way? It wasn't. It it was an easy transition um, because for me, the the way that it worked being assigned to the JMAO as opposed to had I gone, I had a couple of different job offers. Uh, at one point I had a, a, an offer to go back to a Ranger battalion as a battalion surgeon, uh, to be a battalion surgeon uh, in one of the SF groups, uh, and also to be a, a battalion surgeon in 160th. Those are all staff officer jobs, which would have been a huge turnaround after that four years in med school and after residency, because not only would it be going back and being full time army stuff again, it would have been all the stuff that I disliked back when I, you know, cause I had done, I'd done my company headquarters time on the B team and uh, you know, disliked almost everything about that. So it would have been all the things I really disliked, but yeah. basically what I got to do because of my assignment to the JMAO was uh, finish residency and then go directly to being a staff physician at at Womack on Fort Bragg. So I was working, you know, just I was doing it as a resident two weeks ago. Now I'm doing it as a staff, you know, seeing patients all day. And then I have this operational commitment on the side. But uh, because it was in the community, and again, I, you know, I already had that exposure and spoke the lingo, and there's certain things they didn't have to train me up on. It was a pretty easy transition. and And it's what I had been wanting and craving for those you know seven years that i was out of it is you know it's like uh, get back i want to have a gun in my hand again i want to be jumping out of planes again i want to be i want to be around dudes that i have something in common with doing a mission that matters again not just seeing six months of shoulder pain and two days (laughs) of vaginal bleeding and a kid with a runny nose Uh, two days of vaginal bleeding that sounds like a good weekend (laughs) the uh i'm i'm curious with the with the getting back into the operational capacity, is, is there a um, an element of the Army's got a fuck ton invested in you and they don't want you kicking doors in? And like, was there ever kind of a, a, a power struggle with them in, in terms of them trying to keep you from being one of the guys or they're totally cool with you going? No, that's, you know, uh, it's because of the unique mission in SOF. It, you know, every, once you join, you know how it is. Once, once you're in that tribe, you're in the tribe. Yeah. Whether, you, whether you're in the tribe as an operator, as an enabler, as an augmentee, once you're in that tribe and you show that you can carry your weight, you're in that tribe. And uh, it's because it's such a different mentality. And I think also because of the fact that you know how it is on a team that uh, was anybody trained to do this? Well, no. But does anybody know how to do it? Well, yes. <laughs> Okay, well, you're going to do it, yeah. you know, or you're going to give a class in it. You're going to show everybody else how to do it, right? Yeah. There's a lot of stuff that you do because it's like, well, we this needs to get done, and we are we are these tiny maneuver units. We're not like you know big army or big navy, so we got to figure out a way to get it done. So the concept of yeah, you're a on paper you're a this, but we know you can do this, so we're going to have you do that. Yeah, you know, so when you know when I rolled out, you know, it's being just another guy in the stack or being the guy man in the belt fed out the hatch. Yeah. You know, is it weird that a doctor was manning a 240 on an objective in Iraq? Yes. I think it's awesome. Yeah. But, but but the guys knew that I knew how to operate that and that, uh, and I could do that if I had to, it wasn't like in the mission briefing, it wasn't okay. And we're going to have doc on the 240. It was just, by the when everybody moved around and I saw something that needed to be done, I got this. Go ahead, yeah. you know, and and did it, and nobody batted an eye. Yeah. And so at this point, you're 38. Uh, no, at this point, because I, I I went through. I was an intern at 40, so I was 43. Oh, 40, my first first God deployment. Damn. So let's. Uh, I let's, turned 43, I think, on my first deployment. So let's get balls deep into that. Where where, where was the first deployment to? Was it Iraq? It was to Iraq, yeah. Uh, and so that was 2010, 11. 2010. Uh, there's some ISIS activity at that point. Yeah, that was, uh, that was the time period where we thought coming out of 2009, we're like, Oh, things are, things are on the downslope. 
and ended up uh, some some pockets ended up kicking up again. Sater City kicked up again as it always does, and yeah. uh, so spent a little bit of time there. How uh, how long was that a six month deployment there? No, it was a ninety day. So okay. all of my all of my deploy. Uh, some of my deployments were, you know, deployments where I got a, hey, we need you to go right now type thing were a little bit shorter, but my yeah. planned deployments were all right around 90 days. Yeah, okay. Uh, so in that, that time in Iraq, were there uh, pretty substantial missions that you went on that... Uh, we were pretty... Initially, we were not. And, and it ha- uh, initially, I think it had to do... You, know, you might, like anything, you might have the best asset available to you, but if you don't know that asset's available to you, you won't utilize that asset. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, we got into to country and the and the the place that they kind of had us. This is where you, this is going to be your day to day activities. The the people that really needed us the mo- most didn't know. They they might have known from a briefing, but they weren't on a day to day basis. They weren't thinking, "Hey, we have this uh, this available to us." Yeah. So um, it wasn't until uh, about three or four weeks into that trip that we got to kind of move around the battle space a little bit and get utilized a little bit more. And then at that point, the op tempo was pretty high, pretty much for the duration of that trip. Yeah. Uh, any specific, like, no shit, good gunfights that you can share? Uh, all of them were pretty one-sided on that trip. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was, it was a lot of... That was a, that was a point in the war that um, if we were going out, the intel was good. We were going out heavy and, uh, you know, much probably heavier than we needed to because because we could, you know, yeah. going out with, you know, a big hammer to take care of everything. So, uh, yeah, pretty much there there was nothing that was like, oh, shit, this could be it. Yeah. You know, it was always it was there was a few mad minutes here and there. Mm-hmm. But like I say, it was it was pretty one-sided yeah did you uh were you on a, a 240 most of the time or was it that was a one that was a one one day one time thing <laughs> did you get to shoot it and i didn't yeah, <laughs> yeah so that was yeah. it was uh it i was hoping yeah. i was i was like this is this is going to be it this is going to be the story i tell for years yeah. Yeah. if i get to lay down scunion with this thing <laughs> this is going to be awesome uh w- were there any instances where you got to use your medical training on that deployment? yeah there were a, cu- a couple of guys and it was uh <clears throat> The, the injuries that I treated on our guys were actually kind of incidental. Uh, some stuff from, uh, from breaching coming back yeah. that had to be addressed. Um, I treated a couple of uh, bad guys, mm-hmm. uh, one of which could have gotten out of being injured, but I guess he was a little bit of a slow learner. And, and the... Uh, the guys who took him down exercised a lot of restraint because he was a, an individual that we, we wanted to talk to later and patched him up and, and did really well. And then, uh, another couple that just, you know, you just, when you see helicopters coming in, when you're outnumbered by that many people, you probably shouldn't pick up that AK and some guys that exercised some, some bad judgment, even though they were given a, given a choice, but ultimately, we patched them up, and they ended up doing okay. What uh, What were the extent of their injuries? Uh, typically torso, GSWs to the torso. Yeah. From our, guy. our guys are, are good at get, about getting getting torso hits. Yeah. So not not a lot of uh, oh, I just winged him in the leg. There wasn't yeah. a lot about a lot of that. So. I'm assuming most of the uh, small arms fire was green tip five five six. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, we we ran into that. I mean, it's I think it's a shitty round to use. It's been established for quite a long time now. Yet it still gets used. But uh, I'm continually dumbfounded at how many dudes will get you know lit up in a fucking torso and survive it you know to me that kind of defeats the fucking purpose but yeah it's uh you're it's surprising when you see how many five five six holes you can punch through somebody yeah and uh and they ran they were yeah. still running yeah. <laughs> not, not not only did they not die yeah. they were still you, you see them running on isr yeah. or you see them running right in front of you yeah <laughs> Yeah, no, we, uh, right outside of Tikrit, we shot a guy that uh, I think probably eight or nine times at least. I mean, all in the fucking torso, and that motherfucker dropped his AK and took off running, you know, and disappeared into the fucking tree line. I mean, we found him later dead, but still, you know, had he had an RPG or a fucking suicide vest or was in a vehicle, you know, like he absolutely kept going for a lot longer than you would have thought. You know? And I'm wondering if the only reason he dropped the AK was it, it either jammed or it took around. 
Well, no, yeah. So <laughs> in, in finding him, and we actually uh, captured the AK, too, it was, I mean, it was for sure luck. But, there, I mean, it was like fucking Jesus wounds in his hands. Like we shot the gun out of his hands. He mm-hmm. had, you know, right through the meat of both of his hands. And, and even on each pistol grip, there was a, a fucking bullet hole and blood all over him. It was, uh, it was crazy that we shot it out of his hands. But uh, it, that's for sure why he dropped it. But, mm-hmm. but again, I just, you know, the fact that um, – that it takes that long to neutralize somebody when you're that close to hitting their central nervous system, uh, you know, their spinal cord or so many fucking major organs in there that, that if they're severed, they'll bleed out fairly quick. Um, yep. you know, just, it, it baffles me at, at how, um, incapable it is of, of, uh, neutralizing somebody very quickly in, in a lot of cases. But, um, all right. So that was the Iraq deployment. Then you did two to Afghanistan and two to Horn of Africa or, uh, to Northern Africa. Mm-hmm. Was it uh, Afghanistan and then Africa or vice versa? Or? It was uh, Afghanistan, Africa, Africa, Afghanistan. Okay. Uh, of those four deployments, what uh, well, what can you share about them? Obviously, it was subsequent after after Iraq. So uh, I'm assuming North Africa, you know, Libya had, had uh, fallen at that point, I'm assuming. So uh, what kind of what can you talk about what, why you guys were there? Uh, that... Or, I can't. I wish I could get into detail. I really, I really can't. It's and honestly, if I did get into detail, it wouldn't be all that interesting. Yeah. So it was for for both North Africa ones. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They were. Uh, they were. Uh, they were run of the mill. They were nothing that anybody hasn't done. You know, thousands of times. The only different, you know, the fact that the setting was there and not somewhere else. But I got you. Um, yeah. That's yeah. But so in Afghanistan, it was 2013 and, uh, 2013 was my last one. So 2011 and then, and then 2013, okay. uh, 2011, it was, a, it was a pretty active time. Uh, I was working out of, out of Sharana primarily and, uh, but traveled all over, you know, uh, were you doing the same mission set in terms of your involvement in the team that you were in Iraq in terms of just kind of a jack of all trade, just doing what needed to be done or were, was yeah. it more specialized for now for the, for the most part, it was, it was pretty much the same. It was, uh, you know, so, sometimes that meant that I was on, on an aircraft, you know, just, you know, I was you know, on the aircraft that they infilled and I was going to be there for, you know, as a backup, either if they needed somebody on the ground or, you know, as a Kazovac platform, uh-huh. um, sometimes that was pre-positioning somewhere and sometimes that was that was out, you know, yeah. walking with them. It just depended. Was the op tempo most nights? Uh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, were there pockets of heavier resistance? Were, were there bigger gun battles that uh, you and your team experienced on that deployment? Uh, the the biggest kind of run and gun fight that happened, uh, there were two on, on that trip, uh, and both of which it just ended up kind of by happenstance. Those were nights that we were in – more of a uh, we're going to fall back and if you need us type role so i ended up not being directly engaged you know it was more um, we're either getting it over the radio or we're watching it on the monitor and uh, and taking care of people when they came in and one one of those was actually a seal team and the other one was uh was a platoon of rangers oh no shit yeah. any uh, big casualties for either of them yeah that was actually the that's the only trip where i where i lost anybody really so, yeah uh, ranger staff sergeant by the name of jeremy katzenberger um, leading from the front, first man off the Chinook, going on to objective, and uh, really uh, just a, like a one in a million shot that came came out of a window and uh, hit in just the right place. And uh, he, you know, fortunately, and I and I remember specifically looking his squad mates in the eye and telling this, I'm like, there's absolutely no way he f- ever felt any pain. He didn't even know he got hit. Oh wow! Yeah, it's uh, it's uh. I still kind of follow follow along. Uh, there's a bunch of us that, that that post about him every year on the anniversary of that. And um, he was married, um, had kids that are that are growing up now. And it's uh, I st- I still think about it from time to time. But I you know I I told his medics. I I told the guys in the squad. I told the medics that were there, and we told ourselves in the after action review uh, after that that you know there was nothing. Literally the exact same injury in an operating room in, you know, Johns Hopkins. The outcome would have been the same. Yeah. So it's, so it's quick. Yeah. So it's not one, you know, I, I, I would hate 
to be, and I, and I know people that are, that are out there with memories of if onlys. Yeah. You know, and, and I'm, I'm glad I don't have that. And, yeah. I'm, and I'm fortunate because, because I was in med school and I kind of came to the war late, you know, I, I don't have these stories about, you know, oh, the day we lost, you know, four people. Yeah. Or anything like that, but we had uh, we had a few casualties uh, on that specific night, that specific engagement. Um, all of the rest of them, we were able to take care of, and they went on to rehab and did very very well. And he was the only one that we lost. Do you recall that specific engagement? What the the gist of the mission was? Um, I'm trying to remember if it was a bomb maker or a key leader. Um, I don't remember. I, I know I know the location, and I've seen it both on ISR and on ground footage because there is some ground footage of it. But I don't I don't remember exactly who the target was and and why they were there. What, so he was first off the Chinook. Uh, mm -hmm. He gets taken down. Did they continue on and, and successfully complete that mission? And they did. Yeah. yeah. So they they came down. The guys came down the ramp right after him. Um, immediately identified that he was down. Uh, while returning fire, got him to a covered position. And that's, uh, they ended up kind of hunkering down in that covered position um, and providing support while guys were taking care of him that ultimately enabled people to, to maneuver around and take out the target. Yeah, that's good. Uh, any details from the, uh, the SEAL guys that were there that you were supporting? Uh, they actually, they had some minor injuries and that was about it. But I do, I do remember them saying, so this was... Uh, we were uh, staging out of Asadabad. So I don't, have you ever been to Asadabad? Mm. So it's basically, it's, you're on a, you have a flat portion, and then you have a mountain, and then uh, Pakistan's on the other side of that mountain. Uh, and in the early days of the conflict, guy, they were getting mortared from that mountain all the time, so now they have OPs up there. But they were, I think a, a little bit north of us was where their objective was. But basically, the only way to hit this objective was to be going uphill like this yeah and i just i remember him saying there's nothing the only thing worse than going uphill in in unforgiving gravelly terrain at night is doing it while people are shooting it <laughs> <laughs> or going downhill uncontrollably yeah that's uh, down, that, that, that would be that worse. same hill <laughs> yeah um the, the uh kind of the the element of you being there and supporting rangers seals you know, some of your team members on Green Berets, I'm assuming that was fairly common. Like you were kind of the, the soft doc that was, yeah. Were you getting bounced around a lot? Because oh yeah. Of, That's yeah. all, all of my deployments. Typically it's like, okay, this is where you're going to live, but be prepared. So you are a theater level asset. So be prepared to get bounced around. Yeah. That initial trip uh, to Afghanistan, I made it all the way out to Balamor Gob. I stayed in uh, Jalalabad for a while, Mezi Sharif for a few days. So, you know, here, there, yeah. everywhere, yeah. you know, all over, all over the battle space. And then, excuse me, um, my last trip, the one that I talk about in the book, there we were primarily in Mezi Sharif. So we moved around a little bit. I spent a little bit of time back at Bagram and, and out at Camp Chapman. But for the most of, most of that trip, we were just working out of Mez. Would you say that that was operationally the most uh, significant or busy time that you were there? It was initially, and then uh, we got wintered in. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's not long after the, the mission that I talk about in the intro chapter to the book. Um, you got huge amounts of snowfall, mm -hmm. and basically... Nobody was doing We're, we're like, nobody, they're not doing anything, we're not doing anything. Yeah. So, you know... Mother Nature kicked both your asses. Mother Nature kicked everybody's asses. Yeah. So, uh, it's, and it's, it's funny because it... Uh, uh, Mez at the time was a very secure installation. Yeah. Like that was if that, that was a place you didn't have to worry about. There's no green on blues happening here. We're we are good. Yeah. So that was uh, you know unlike some places you go that it's like hey even on post you're going to be strapped everywhere you go. Yeah. There wasn't a and we were staying even on our own compound. Yeah. So unless we left the compound we didn't have to be strapped at all. And I remember at one point I I figured out as it started to thaw and we were getting more into operational stuff again, I said, uh, you know, I've gone over a month without carrying a gun. That's the longest time in my adult life. I have not carried a gun <laughs> no and shit. it's been in a combat zone. Yeah. <laughs> That's a fucking trip. Chicago is more dangerous. 
by quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, if you could, uh, can you kind of walk through just uh, the, the gist of that, uh, the intro story that you share in the book? Yeah, so that was, uh, uh, we had, we had uh, a target up in, in the mountains, uh, north of where we were, um, good, solid, good solid intel on, on how many were there and who they were. And uh, because of the length of the movement, the uh, kind of inhospitable terrain, um, and the difficulty that it was going to be, that, that wasn't some place that you could have an aircraft just loitering somewhere. Um, it was a little bit of a difficult area to get in and out of, so there was no good place. It wasn't like some place where you can just fast rope right onto the lawn and boom, you're in the building. So we had to offset, you know, and, you know, you, you get into that weird operational thing. It's like, all right, well, if we have to op offset this much, then we really need to offset this much because we need to be where they can't hear yeah. us and, and even know we were there. So basically it ended up being, okay, this is going to be a walk-in. This is not going to be a fly or drive right to the target. So for that reason, they said, okay, we're going to need a little bit more medical support in case things go south on the ground. And the, the PA and I uh, went along on that mission uh, that I talk about. And uh, it was, although it had not snowed where we were, there had already been snowfall there, so it was it was cold. It was crisp. Uh, there was s snow on the infill uh, LZ, and then we made our way up through some some pretty shitty terrain, as you know, <laughs> to get there. Uh, and then when we got there, uh, you know, the plan was, it's, of course, this was a time in the war where you get in position and you're doing callouts, and uh, that's how it was supposed to happen, and that's not how it happened. Yeah. ended up uh, being premature uh, we were able to piece together later kind of why it didn't work out that way but um, ended up being what, what we thought was going to be a leisurely okay I'm, I'm knelt down at, a, at one road intersection over just waiting for all this to get cleaned up ended up being sprinting across open terrain and, and ultimately up into a support position and uh, that was the Second time in my deployment, so I, n I never fired my weapon in all of my, my deployments. I never, I, no shots fired in anger. That was the only time, and I didn't put it in, the, in that chapter because it's a little bit anticlimactic, is I, this was the time that I really no shit thought, okay, this is getting ready to happen. Yeah. And then ultimately, uh, the guy jumped down. Instead of turning towards us and presenting as a target, he jumped down into a ravine. Oh, wow. And uh, they ended up finding him two days later two villages down but oh shit yeah that's that guy was that guy was motivated he ran God damn. <laughs> what, what was his story do you know he was a bomb maker yeah, yeah. so he um uh, he uh, everybody else on the objective ended up getting dealt with accordingly um he escaped justice on that particular day yeah uh, i'm sure it, i don't know he he might be there he might be living in a nice apartment in kabul now i don't yeah. know but it's probably, it's probably <laughs> part of the fucking leadership yeah um uh, Maybe he's like the uh, director of transportation. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. The uh, you talk about it in the book in terms of you know at that point you're quite a bit older than and, and yeah. we'll get into some of the the premise of the book because it, it's pretty fascinating. Is that you know special operations is for sure a younger man's game. I wouldn't say it's a young man's game. Um, you know because like we talked about there is an element of mental and physical maturity i think that uh, lends itself to your success there having said that yes there are guys that are in their early 20s i mean I, I was there as an early early 20s guy but um but most of the guys are late 20s early 30s uh, and i would agree it's a good age but you know when you're talking mid 40s upper 40s i know for me i mean i'm 43 now and uh up until about 40 you know, you know late late 30s early 40s is really when i started to kind of feel it mm -hmm. I, I guess you know and, and granted i didn't spend 32 years in, in the military but i spent 12 and a half and, and it was a hard 12 and a half I was you know say from, that's a, that's a hard 12 and a half know, yeah from, from 18 to 30 where you know i think like a dumbass um i've i managed to not think that i would ever be 43 you know not not that i didn't think that i wouldn't make it i just never thought about it you know and yeah. so I, I there's a lot of things looking back that i'm like god damn i wish i would have not done this or done this or taken care of this better or what what have you but um you know the biggest thing for me is like sleep uh how 
how negatively not getting enough of the right sleep will impact me now versus back then. Back then it didn't seem, it didn't feel like it mattered. You know, right. I could get three hours of sleep, felt fucking great the next morning. I could be hung over. I mean, it didn't matter. Right. I, I'd hurt something two days later, it'd feel totally normal. You know, um, now it's like I, I tweak, you know, my fucking wrist and four months later, I still can't fucking do a push up. you know, right. and it's like, uh, so I'm, I'm curious, you know, even when you're talking about the times of being there, you were older than I am now. Um, you know, and, and you mentioned, you know, that being a, a feed in and of itself, but I'm curious, like, were there times where you kind of thought to yourself, like, what the fuck am I doing here at, at this age? Or was it, you know, were you kind of taking this approach even then and, and, uh, and it having a, a positive impact or, or how did that shake out? You know, there were certainly times in, in, in training, uh, you know, that's cause every year we would be doing, you know, uh, train ups and, uh, I don't train ups. It's it's always somehow you always end up in the woods at Fort Bragg on the coldest night of the fucking year. I yeah. don't know how that happens, <laughs> but it always happens. And you're tired, and you've been up, and uh, your foot, and one of the fucking tubes on your nods keeps going out, and your neck's killing you, uh, and your equipment is just not riding right, and then it starts to rain. And I, and yeah, I start thinking shit like I could be sitting in an ER somewhere up to my neck fucking, and tits you know, and ass. <laughs> just, you know, just fucking off, you know, three hots in a cot, you know, never getting, I could never, I could conceivably never get rained on again yeah. or never be cold again. Yeah. Right. Uh, never have to sleep on an uncomfortable slab somewhere again, yeah. if that's what I so ch choose to do. Yeah. So there's certainly times that you think about that. But then the you know the flip side of that is you know you think is that really the life that I want? Yeah. This is this is what I signed up for. This is when I really feel alive, and and knowing that the training, that the the shit sandwich that you eat in training reaps dividends in combat. Knowing that is what what keeps you going. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, there was never a time there. Well, I, I I will say that on on my last deployment, on that very deployment, was the point that I made the decision that that was going to be my last deployment. And it wasn't, there was not a bitter feeling with, associated with that. There wasn't a, I just can't fucking do this anymore. It was a, okay, I can do it. And I proved that I can do it. And I feel great about that. Um, but it is late in my career. I'm coming up on retirement. And it, the, the turning point for me was uh, before that, on one, on one of those trips that I took uh, to North Africa, I had a, a guy around my age who was a, a fellow physician who was scheduled to retire a little bit ahead of me told me, he said, Mike, you're going to want to do this thing where you push to the very last, like you're going to want to be in the unit and be doing this as late as you possibly can. And then you're going to think I'm going to turn in all my stuff at Bragg. Then I'm going to go home and I'm going to get my retirement paperwork and I'm going to be done. Don't do that. He said, cause that's what I'm trying to do now. And I'm regretting it because Really, you need to, he said, you are unselfish your entire career. You're giving to the military. You're giving to the force. You need to take that last year of your career and be selfish because nobody's going to do it for you. Yeah. And that's the time that you make sure you have a job lined up. Uh, your medical records are now accurate. All that shit you lied about so you could keep <laughs> jumping out of airplanes and keep deploying, you need to be honest about. Yeah. Um, you need to understand how all your retirement benefits work. So all those, all those briefings that you're going to want to go, oh, I can just waive that. No, you really want to go to those. You really want to understand it. And he was absolutely right. And I ended up getting out of the unit with enough time that I, I spent, I tell people I spent almost my last 18 months on active duty getting MRIs and yeah. EMGs and sleep studies and, and all this other stuff to document all the stuff that was wrong and typing a resume, which, I mean, you'd think, oh, I'm a doctor. I'll just get a job. It's No, it's still... Still competitive. You gotta do, yeah, it's still competitive. You still got to have a, you know, uh, a resume and go to yeah. interviews and it's not automatic. You Unless know? you go work for the VA. <laughs> Unless right. you go work for the VA, then you just show up and yeah. yeah. I could probably get a job as a surgeon. I, yeah. No, that's, <laughs> a whole, that's a whole nother fucking, that's a whole nother episode. Um, before we get uh, any further in the book, just one politics thing. Over the last, you know, two months or so, having spent, you know, some time in Afghanistan, especially in Masri Sharif, where, 
you know, that prison was basically fucking disbanded and, yeah. and uh, just seeing what's going on there. What are your thoughts on it? Yeah, uh, it's, I mean, to, to me, the, the, li- the, the linchpin bad decision was abandoning bag- Bagram. And, yeah. I, and I, I know everybody said it. I, I, I'm not going to say I was the first person to say it. I did say it before I had heard anybody else say it. And I, I'm glad that my opinion has been validated by hearing so many other people say it. Um, I have a, a friend of mine uh, went to medical school with also a former 18 Delta. We, and we were, there were actually uh, three 18 Deltas in my class. One of them is a uh, Politically moderate. I, I, won't, I won't say he's, he's on the left, but he's politically moderate, and he was not a Donald Trump fan, which I know a lot of people. I wasn't a huge Donald Trump fan. I know a lot of people that weren't, right? I voted for him twice. Um, this individual voted for Joe Biden, because, and he and I had conversations about it, and he said, you know, just in good conscience for all these reasons, this is what I feel I need to do. I'm like, okay, fine. He had a, it, what, a rational reason from his point of view. But when all this shit went down... <laughs> He sent me a message just fucking railing, like, I'm so pissed, and I do feel like like I have a, a part in this because that's who I voted for. And the very last thing that he put, he said, you know, I don't know what the right way to do this, but we're damn sure seeing the 100% wrong way to do it. Yeah. He said, this is the worst way that it could have gone down. Yeah. Like, anything else would have been even one step above. There's no way it could have been worse. Yeah. Um, and that, that's what bothers me the most. I don't see, I do think that our presence there kept major shit from going on on U.S. soil and other places because, you know, if you got somebody tied up in the ro- against the ropes, they, they can't be doing bad shit other places. Yeah. I do think that, that there's an argument to be made that, you know, for that. I think there's a huge argument to be made also in that the huge strides we made forward in trauma care, in how we wear our kit and our TTPs and everything else over the last 20 years, that needed to happen, unfortunately, because, you know, the, the Cold War era, we went into this as, the, as still being the Cold War era military. Yeah. With, you know, the, our TTPs and our equipment and the generals in charge. And now we've pivoted to something that it's going to be much easier, even if we have to go to near peer, peer or near peer now, it's going to be much easier because of the lessons learned in the last 20 years. Yeah. So that's another thing. And then the third thing that I tell people, I, you know, I tell my, you know, my fellow veterans is it, you went out each night. It wasn't about flags. It wasn't about politicians. It wasn't about anything else other than the people to your left and right, the people that were in the stack with you, the people that got off the helicopter with you, were going to be getting back on the helicopter with you. Yeah. And if you succeeded in that, and gave a hundred percent, then you hold your head high. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, uh, and on a on a micro scale, I think that's a great way to look at it. And I think on a on a macro scale, you know, my thoughts are is that every single person that volunteers for the military, you know, is is essentially, you know, giving their life or potentially giving their life. I mean, they're mm-hmm. signing their life over to the United States government for that government uh, and its elected officials to use that individual in, in the way that they see best fit, you know? And, and so there's, to me, there's a huge honor in, in, in that in and of itself, whether you go to war or not, or, or whatever mm-hmm. is the fact is, is that that, you know, that that may happen, it may cost you your life and, and you're willing to, to sacrifice two years, three years, four years, 32 years, um, you know, to, to that cause. Um, and, and I think that's a, a very honorable thing to do. Now, uh, kind of the middle of the road of the people that, that have been to Afghanistan and, and uh, you know, have, have really sacrificed their bodies, their minds, you know, thousands of, of uh, troops that didn't, didn't come home. Similarly, though, is that, you know, that I, I think that that same principle still applies. Is that, you know, that the fact is, is that every decision any of us make, generally speaking, um, you know, you, you do the best with what you have at the time, um, you know, and, and, and we all do that. And so, you know, whether or not uh, you can look back and say this was a mistake or that was a mistake or, or whatever. I mean, you know, if I had picked the right six fucking numbers, I'd have won $450 million the other night, you know, right. like it's, it's easy to say I should have done this, you right. know, but, but I, I don't think there's any uh, productive benefit to, to doing that, you know? And so 
uh, I, I think you know everybody has a has a reason to be proud that they did uh, what they did, and and uh, you know they they did what our country asked them to do when they asked them to do it, uh, and and pretty fucking successfully given the parameters and the um, you know guidelines and, and rules of engagement that a lot of times were not exactly in our favor, but. Um, for for you, I guess, does that um, is there any element of, of uh, you know kind of tarnishing the the image of you being there that, that exists? Because I know some veterans feel that way, and, yeah. and um, I, you know I'm, I'm curious kind of what what your perspective is on that. No, there there's not there's not a tarnishing. You know, it's I there's. trying to think of the best way to word it you know uh, i wish the government would have done a better job with how we got out of there and getting our people out and getting our allies out that bothers me yeah the i see that as a separate issue if if am i bothered by the fact that the same people are now in charge of afghanistan that were in charge when we got there? No. And uh, I think that's that will sort itself out over time. It's going to take some time. But it's, you can't, uh, since this wasn't like, you know, going in and Germany surrendering to us or Japan surrendering to us or whoever surrendering, you know, with a formal ceremony. You know, it, it's, it's not like that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Afghanistan is a, it's only a country because we've drawn lines on a map. I mean, it's a bunch of different tribal areas. Yeah. You know, there's a guy somewhere in Afghanistan <clears throat> right now who doesn't give a shit who is sitting behind a desk in Kabul somewhere. He's never cared about that. He cares about the, what the rainy season is going to be like this year, if he has enough to feed his animals and to feed his family, and that roof that's leaking. These are the things that that individual cares about. We can't make him care about, hey, but you're going to get a democracy. Yeah. You know, you're going to get Wi-Fi. You know, we can't make him, you know, I, I, I used to say this in meetings all the time when I was the chief of emergency medicine. You can't make me care about shit that doesn't matter. And those are all things to him that just don't matter. Yeah. So, you know, to, to expect a country to be, uh, the populace of a country to be motivated and say, no, we're not going to, you know, it's we're kind of casting our Western idealism uh, on them. And I, and I don't know if, if that's, uh, I don't, I don't think that's something that we can waste a lot of brain energy doing. Yeah. I think sooner or later, sooner or later, that country will sort itself out. But if you look at anywhere, I mean, so let, let's to, to draw kind of a similar lines here. Let's look at Japan. So, we in World War II, we beat Japan into submission. We 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 beat them across all of those islands in the Pacific back to their own island, and then we nuked them on their own island. Okay, unconditional surrender. Unconditional surrender to the point that when the the treaty was drawn up and it said you will surrender all weapons, families were giving over samurai swords yeah. that were hundreds of years old. They were really not a threat to us. Right, they were essentially giving up their entire family identity. I've got a, a friend of mine uh, who is, is a big historian in in um, in Japanese swords, and, and he talks about this. So they were, if ever anybody was beaten in the in the 20th century in modern history, it was Japan. Yeah. Now f- fast forward to the 70s and 80s, and even into the 90s, Japan is essentially ruling the world with you know the auto industry you know almost putting detroit completely out of business with tech with all this other stuff so you know what should we expect that you know just because we beat somebody on the battlefield they assume a, a you know a subjugated role like forever no that's not the way things work i mean you know the roman empire doesn't exist anymore yeah. the british empire doesn't exist anymore Someday we're not going to be a world leader, as hard as that is to swallow. You know, yeah. it's. I don't think it's any time soon, but someday that's going to happen. Should so. I bet it will be? <laughs> yeah, it, <laughs> I don't know. And more and more, it looks like it could be in our lifetime, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think it's the beginning of the end. I, I between uh, 
the education, or I, I would call it the indoctrination system mm-hmm. that we have, uh, which I think stems from the late 70s Department of Education coming online that, that was the beginning of the end of, of the school system and not leaving it up to states, I think it was a huge fucking mistake. And I think you're seeing it now is that, um, you know, it's run so rampant that, uh, you know, we talked about this on the other podcast that I do. Uh, you know, the producer behind the desk right now, um, you know, is 18 from, from a school here and you know, hearing some of the positions that, uh, you know, that, that are just common uh, really common positions for most kids that are graduating high school right now are, are so vastly different yeah. from, from what they were when I graduated or even people that graduated 10 years ago um, to the point where it's, for, for me, it's alarming, you know, um, and it's to no fault of their own. Uh, you know, they're, they're a product of the environment that we as a society have made for them. Uh, yep. but, the, but the people that have created that environment for them, uh, I think, uh, don't have the same uh, ideals or goals or principles that, uh, that I think most Americans traditionally have had, you know, and I think that, uh, that that's going to bite us in the ass really, really fucking bad here sooner than later. But, um, at any rate, getting into the book, um, I, I love the, the organization of it, uh, because it's okay. not so far in the fucking weeds and anyone, uh, just like you're talking about, you know, the, the doctors that explain thing like, being being in dog training uh, professionally, I, I see that a lot when professional dog trainers are trying to work with just regular non-dog trainer clients is that they're speaking way, way above the pay grade in terms mm-hmm. of what they can understand. And most professions, I think, are guilty of that. Um, I thought that you did a really, really good job of, of not doing that. Not that it's super elementary or, or too elementary. It's a, a really good mix of you know, good in-depth information that, uh, you know, that's easily digestible by people who aren't industry, <clears throat> industry experts or professionals in any one of these, these given areas. So I, I think it's a really good mix. Um, and I'll, I'll read just the, uh, table of contents here real quick to give, give the listener an idea. Um, <clears throat> chapter one is uh, performance versus longevity for the warrior athlete. Two is aging. Three is sleep. Four is diet and nutrition. Five is fitness. Six is martial arts. Seven is recovery. Eight is supplements. Nine is health maintenance. Ten is your tribe uh, slash community. And then uh, then the conclusions. Um, now hearing the table of contents, can you give the listener kind of the reader's digest as why you wrote the book and what you're trying to accomplish with it before we get into some of the particulars? Yeah, so I... Uh as you, as you, as we've talked about, because of the kind of the unconventional way that that I came up and and becoming a physician late, but then instead of working as a hospitalist, going back out into the into the soft community, I had a lot of struggles that I had to deal with. As a you know, like I said, I was an intern at age forty, and there's a profound shift. That's when you notice that you don't spring back. You know, a cup of coffee and an IOU just doesn't get it anymore after being awake for 24 hours. Yeah. You start to feel that. Um, the, uh, oh, I'm going to get Pop-Tarts from the vending machine and work on a sugar rush for three hours. Yeah. That doesn't get it anymore. You start, to, you start to have to pay the interest on that credit card. So as I started to figure that out, that you know this is a struggle for me. So I need to figure out, I can't treat my digestive system like a landfill anymore. I can't get by on caffeine and nicotine. I quit dipping by that point. Um, I got to figure this out. So I said, well, you know, I've invested all this time into this medical education. So I, who should, I should be the one to know this. So I'm going to have to do the research on my own, which is what I did. And little by little, I would piece it together. And it's constantly and still is an evolving process. You know, every once in a while, I'm like, you know what, that's, I thought I had it figured out, but now either because I'm a little bit older or because I found something different, that's not quite the way to do it. So it's still I- evolving. But as it did, and I figured out that hey, I can do this and I can perform. You know, I can't. Maybe I can't perform at a tier one operator level, but I can perform as an enabler and not be a hindrance, and I can still do that. Um, and then I, I wanted to carry that over into my re- retirement. There was a little bit of a blip there where I started to kind of fall off the wagon and let myself just become retired guy. 
and caught myself uh, and and made that ground back up again. But as I was solving all these problems, whether it was recovery or sleep or what supplements I should take or wh- how should what sh- I've never bothered to I I had never counted a calorie, never counted my macros, never paid paid attention. It was food was just stuff that I shoveled in my gullet. That was it. And I realized I had to pay attention to all this stuff. So as I started to kind of uh, collate all this information, it was about the same time that, that I started to do my own podcast. And I would just mention things offhandedly about my workouts or my nutrition. And then I'd start getting the emails or the social media questions about, well, what, what should I be? I'm about your age, Doc. What should I do? You know, you talk about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Is that okay for me? I've got these injuries. And I started answering all these emails, and it, it was like being on repeat all the time. And a little voice in my head said, wouldn't it be easier if just every time you got one of these emails, you said, here's a link to a resource. I've already done the research. It's all in here yeah. for this question and for whatever questions you're going to have. So ultimately, I had that thought. That thought didn't fully materialize, actually, until I talked to uh, Tucker Max, who runs Scribe Publishing. And, and he was the one that was like, that's the book you want to write. Yeah. And I was like, of course, that's the book essentially that's already written. Yeah. <laughs> 300,000 times. Right. <laughs> One of the things that I find challenging, uh, and, and I mean, really dog training isn't completely different. It's different, but um, where it's paralleled and very similar is, is that, you know, techniques change, science doesn't change, but it evolves. Mm-hmm. You know, what we thought you know, made sense. And this is scientific fact. I mean, that's one of the big problems I have with a lot of what's being pushed uh, in a lot of different ways, whether it's nutrition or COVID or fucking whatever is that, you know, it's, Hey, this is science. It's fact. And fucking like, if you disagree with it, you're a a flat earther basically. And it's like, you you know, I mean, I I can look at just when I was 20 years old, you know, I, I can look back 20 years ago and think of what we knew mm-hmm. nutritionally and it's vastly fucking different totally or, or especially like when i was a kid i remember like you know in the 90s it was fat as the absolute enemy for everything right. don't eat eggs you know yeah stemming yeah. from uh was it dr keys back in the 50s of doing very select fucking uh studies of different countries and and you know really manipulating a lot of data that that's has formed i think a lot of the rda and and USDA recommendations that still still exist in conjunction with a lot of the lobbying, which you talk about in the book too, which we'll get into. But you know, to me, you know, again, back then it was like you could eat a whole fucking bag of Twizzlers because well, they're fat free, so they're not bad for you. Like right. there's no fat in it, you can have as much as you want. It's like yep. that's fucking stupid. You know, but but that you know, looking back into the fifties, the turn of the century, two hundred years ago, five hundred, you know. I, I feel like as man-made and processed food has become more and more routine and normal, we've actually taken a number of steps back as a as a race of of society. You know, as as the human race, you know, we have like now you walk into a convenience store. You know, think about think back five hundred years ago, like none of that shit existed. Mm-hmm. None of it did. You know, and, and now that's most of what most people eat most of the time. It's a lot of mosts. But that's the case, right? Yeah. Is, it, is it most people put shit that their body isn't even designed to fucking uh, consume, let alone get anything productive out of, and that and that's most of what they eat, mm-hmm. um, and that's where you know an overwhelming majority of of uh, health problems and, and medical conditions come from. That there, that there just seems to be a big fucking disconnect with. Um, but uh, you know, so my my point in bringing that up is is that to me that that. I can see, uh, present, <coughs> excuse me, presenting a challenge in a book like this, and that it's kind of like iPhone technology. It's like, but you know, and, and having written several books, I know how long it fucking takes to, you know, from the time you say, okay, th- this is it's it, this is it, it's done, to when it's published. Like even by then, it's like, fuck, I I wish I had said this differently, or mm-hmm. I, I wish that wasn't even fucking in there, you know, whatever. You know, how much of that did you struggle with or have to deal with in writing a book like this? And, and are there things in there that already you're like, well, I, I would I would write this different or take this out of there? Uh, I struggled with it quite a bit. And uh, probably the most struggling was in the, the chapter on health maintenance. And uh, in sending that out, just actually at the time that I wrote that and I sent it out to some fellow physicians to look at, some of those guidelines changed. 
uh, you know, whether it was from the American Academy of Cardiologists or, or whoever it might be. Um, but that's, and that's why I put the caveat in there. Two years ago, this was totally different. And two years from now, it's going to be totally different again. At this snap in time, this is what I recommend. Yeah. Okay. And there's going to be some, some, uh, some deviation from that. Um, most of the nutritional stuff I feel pretty good about, and I feel pretty good about that having a degree of longevity. Um, but, you know, and I, I was, I tried to be careful in there in saying that, you know, this is, this is a guide. This is your left and right limits. You can do a little bit more than that. You know, like, like I talk, I, I talk a lot in there about prioritizing protein and about it being, you know, 0.75 grams per pound of body weight. Uh, and that's about what I'm eating now. I have friends of mine who are a lot more active and, or they want to bulk up that are eating a gram per pound. Yeah, okay? Or even and one I, and a quarter. Yeah. Uh, so it's not, again, that's, you know, those are, I write those as, as starting points, but uh, I have the, the biggest thing that I think are going to change over time is the health maintenance is certainly going to, going to change. That's going to be something if I go out and write a sequel to the book, that'll be revised and probably the supplement chapter too, yeah. because even so after writing the book, I had people writing me about, Hey, what about this supplement? And it was a lot of it was stuff I'd never heard of. Yeah. And I look into it and I'm like, wow, there's sure enough, there's some merit to this. So my supplement regime, you know, the, as of the day that I wrote it, that's what I'm taking six months from now, that might be a little bit different. Yeah. You know, I, I'm taking, I wasn't taking glucosamine and chondroitin when I wrote the book. Yeah. I am now uh, because the, the data shows that the, it's, it really only has benefit in people with hip issues. Guess what I have now? A hip issue. Yeah. So I'm taking glucosamine and chondroitin. Yeah. <laughs> That's some funny shit. Um, yeah, no, I, I, don't, uh, I don't envy that position. Uh, you know, similarly, like I wrote a, a dog training book called Team Dog, and it came out in 2015. And, you know, when, like, I'll still get messages or emails now, like, hey, you know, in this chapter you say this, but then – you know, you mentioned in, in this, you know, video of your online training, it, it you know, kind of contradicts like, yeah, mm -hmm. you know, my, I, I learn every time I train a dog and, and thoughts change and, and kind of similarly, you know, team dog is, is kind of this way too, where it's, it's not a step-by-step -step guide. I mean, this is even more than that is it's more of a principled approach at, uh, you know, the, the things that we, we talk about, you know, dog relationship training wise, but, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> what I'd like to do is take, um, like each chapter by chapter, and obviously, you know, I don't want to give all the meat and potatoes of the book, but <laughs> uh, literally, like, a, like kind of a thirty-second sure. synopsis of of what each chapter kind of encompasses. If you're good with with doing that, yeah, absolutely. Uh, all right, so performance versus longevity for the warrior athlete. So the, uh, there's two big things that, that come out of that chapter. Uh, the the first of which uh, is the performance versus longevity aspect of it, and that's something that I had thought about, but I hadn't really put into those words until I was on, I was on a podcast called the switch and I got asked specifically about performance versus longevity. And it kind of crystallized it for me that, you know, so often during those 12 years that you were with the seals, you were all about performance. Mm -hmm. You even talked about, Oh, I was never thinking about what's life going to be like when I'm 40. Not even a little bit. No, your, your 300 meter target was not even a thought your 50 meter target, you know, that threat, as soon as you enter the room, that was your, what you were concentrating on, what we're doing right now. And we, we live a lot of our lives that way as we're all about performance, not thinking about longevity. And what I want people to realize is if you look to longevity, you can have both. If you look to performance, you can have performance for a while at the cost of longevity. And then you <clears throat> might, will probably have neither. Yeah. Um, but you can have, if you, if you're always thinking about longevity, you can always flex your way into performance when you need to. Yeah. Right. So I, I think it's important, especially, you know, I, I've had people that I know of as young as 26, read my book. And I tell them if, if you're not taking away anything else, take away that, yeah. that you need to start thinking about longevity now, yeah. because I didn't when I was your age and I've got the MRIs to prove yeah, it. Now I'm paying for it. And now I'm going to, I'm going to have this right hip's going to get replaced sometime in the next five years. Yeah because of that yeah so that's the one thing from that chapter the other thing is the is i use the term warrior athlete and what i tell people all the time is most people look at fitness as one of in one of two ways 
either as a chore, like, uh, I got it. I guess I'll have to go tomorrow and work out because I didn't get to today or I'm going to have to drag myself over there. It's just like, it's a job, right? It's not something they want to do. Or they look at it as a hobby. Mm-hmm. It's something they kind of, oh, I went to the gym. I didn't really have a plan. I just went over there and I showed up. And that's what's really important, right? Is that I showed up, you know, and I'm at the place where all the equipment's painted purple and we all love each other. And we have pizza day on Friday. <laughs> you know, it's all good. High fives all around. Yeah. Um, so if you look at fitness as a hobby, then it's a hobby. It's, it's a tertiary or quaternary priority. If you look at it as a chore, then it's something you absolutely don't want to do. But if you look at it as a warrior is I get up today and today I'm going to be a slightly better version of myself than I was yesterday because my job as a warrior is to make sure that this body is in the best shape it can be right now. You know, not, not I'm going to get six months of improvement in one day, but I'm going to do something today to make, I'm better than I was yesterday and tomorrow is going to be a little bit easier because of what I did today. If you look at it that way, then it flips a switch in your head and fitness becomes easier. Yeah. Like a, like a capability investment. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. Um, all right. Good shit. So, uh, chapter two aging. So our, our bodies really do change and we have to accept that it's, um, it's not, it's not a theory. It's a fact that, Our connective tissues don't heal as well. Um, We have done micro damage to various parts of our body over years that we are paying the price for. So we can't, I I don't really like the phrase, the biggest cause of injury in old men is thinking that they're young men. I don't think that's 100% true, but there is a, a grain of truth to that, that we have to realize our bodies are different. And because our bodies are different, because we're older, we have to adjust accordingly. A little bit more time to warm up in the morning. You know, it's like when I had my 66 El Camino on a winter morning, I had to go out, start it, and go back in the house. Fucking A. Right? Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, maybe with a new car, you don't have to do yeah. that. But with an older car, you have to do that. We're, we're a little bit older <laughs> car, all right? Yeah. You might have to carry a case of transmission fluid under the seat like I had to do in that 66 <laughs> El Camino. These are all things that you need to think about. So you yeah. need to have, you can't treat your digestive system like a landfill. You have to look at supplementation. You have to eat right and do. And that that chapter is what really feeds into all the other chapters and my approach to sleep, nutrition, yeah. and everything else. Yeah. Speaking of sleep, chapter three is sleep. Sleep. Uh, so uh, the majority of people in the developed world are sleep deprived all the time. Everybody says they want to get more sleep. If you uh, think about the TV commercials, you see everything from sleep number beds, which I happen to own one, my pillow, all this other stuff. You need to invest in your sleep. You need to stop. Again, people treat sleep like this. If only I didn't have to sleep, think of everything I could accomplish. Stop thinking about it that way. Think of sleep as, hey, I get a free eight hours of meditation, uh, muscle building, cleansing of my body, and that's just all going to occur. And all I have to do is lay down and let it happen. So getting good sleep needs to be a priority um, you know, I mentioned in there that, you know, I, guys will buy the, the most expensive optic for their gun and they're sleeping on a mattress that's fucking 15 years old and has bed bugs and is about, and the springs are popping out of it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so you need to, you need to invest in getting proper sleep and you need to make it a priority because that's when your gains occur. And the, the thing that's especially important, if, if there's only one little nugget that people take away from that is neurologically when you're asleep, you know, the cleansing that occurs in your neurological system that's going to help you stave off things like Alzheimer's and things as you get older. And I'm convinced I'm on testosterone replacement. And I'm, I am reasonably sure that the reason that I'm on it is because my sleep was so jacked up for so many years that it screwed up my endocrine system. Yeah. Did you think about doing an entire chapter on hormones and that's probably going to be a follow-up book. I didn't, I didn't want to because, you know, I, I mentioned in the book that my friend Drew Wingy has written two different books on that. One, well, one specifically on testosterone replacement and then one uh, is what he calls the program. Um, he's already done such a good job with that. Should have just stole uh, some of that. Yeah, and, and Drew would have probably been okay with it. The, yeah. the, uh, Drew wrote his book at a little bit higher level because yeah. Drew's a smarter guy than me. Uh, uh, at some point, I'm probably... 
uh, maybe even in cooperation with him, I think would probably be the best way. To, I might write a little more layman's version of what he's already kind of put out there, uh, specifically talking about that. I think I think that'd be a good uh, good supplement, no doubt about it. Especially given the the subtitle of the book of you know men over forty is that that's, that's such a huge part of of nowadays. Um, you know, and, and I think it stands to reason in that you know as your body gets older, it stops making as much of everything as mm-hmm. it did. I mean, stomach acid, fucking testosterone, you know, I mean, things that lube and, and grease your joints, I mean, everything is starts to wear out, you know, and that, that not being yep. an exception. But uh, I know it's an important aspect. Um, chapter four, diet and nutrition. And here's, here's one where I had a couple of questions and, and uh, you know, I, I would say even playing devil's advocate on some of the things that I wanted to, to throw your way. But uh, uh, chapter four, diet and nutrition. Uh, in, in a nutshell, if if it is frozen, canned, or somebody hands it to you through your car window, you shouldn't be eating that. You, you take that even with like fresh fish that are brought in from Alaska that are frozen, flash frozen with no no preservatives, wild caught. No. So thank you for and thank you for catching me on that. No, I I, I think more of the you know frozen dinners. Yeah. You know things of that nature. I got you. Yeah. Some things. I mean, we have to. If you want food like that, there's no getting around it, right? Yeah. It's going to have to spend some time frozen. The closer to source you get, you know, ideally, if we were dressing out an elk right here and walking out back and picking pea pods uh, off off the vine. That's the best meal we could absolutely get. So the closer you can get to source yeah. is is always better. Yeah. Um, you know, portion control is great. Um, I don't believe in starving yourself. I don't believe in fad or exclusionary diets. Some people do well on them. That's fine. That's great. But, you know, I think the data says that most people do well on these exclusionary diets, whether it's the carnivore or vegan or uh, paleo or Adkins uh, if you really get down to the nuts and bolts of it, what we find out is those people lost weight and did better typically because their caloric intake went down and also they were just making healthier choices, you know, is, is they eliminated the things I talked about. Yeah. They stopped in transitioning to veganism or to the carnivore diet. They stopped going through the drive through at McDonald's. And so that is essentially what they got the benefit from. Yeah. Anything else to add uh, on diet nutrition? No, uh, I like, I, I, I always harp on maximize. I do. And so does Mike Dolce harps on, you know, maximize or prioritize your protein. Mm. Uh, and then everything else will typically, you know, fall, fall into play. And when it comes to, we, most Americans get way too many carbs, way too many processed sugars. So look for stuff with a low glycemic index. So, uh, you know, the, the number of the carb count in a salad is the same carb count as in a slice of white bread, but the salad's better for you. Yeah. Calories aren't aren't always calories. Yeah, calories are not equal. Yeah. I, I do like uh, like to hear that. So the the, the parts that uh, just in doing a lot of research myself and having had you know a number of different health professionals, fitness professionals, uh, you know, taking a pretty vested interest myself over the last uh, better part of a decade, I would say, uh, or even plus, is that uh, and this you know I want to caveat this with I'm not trying to um, you know have any trick fuck gotcha you know points or or anything (laughs) like that uh but the the one things i wanted to play devil's advocate on uh, a little bit were some of the uh the red meat uh stuff and and Mm -hmm. trying to limit that um you know and some of the dairy stuff with butter and and uh um and i would say probably the biggest thing was uh was the recommendation of canola oil And, and just in the um that's one thing that just again in trying to figure things out for myself and, and taking a, a pretty vested interest in it is that you know seeing so so much of, of research on uh, different types of vegetable oils being basically fucking poison canola oil being being one of them right. um, you know and, and you know where, where the kind of the um, the process started of of if you look at say from nineteen 60 or so to present day of, of how big of a of a change the way most people eat um you know a, a lot of it stems from you know we which already talked about sugar refined carbohydrates thing you know non-foods basically but a, a huge component of that is uh you know canola oil corn oil so- soybean oil mm-hmm. uh you know rapeseed oil cotton oil you know th- oils that aren't designed to be 
uh, digested basically that, that, um, you know, when, and I won't get too far in the weeds on the, the breakdown of, uh, of, of how, how that da- gets damaged once it's ingested or subjected to a certain amount of heat or whatever. But there are a fuck ton of studies of, uh, and I even brought, brought a couple of them here. There's I'm sure you're welcome to, to check it out, but I wanted to, to just read a little bit industrial seed oils, uh, and, and how unstable they are. Um, you know, the, these fats are, are, uh, you know, unquestionably, um, linked pr- to a pretty significant standpoint of cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes, uh, you know, and, and these kind of lipid profiles that, that do a lot of fucking damage stem from that. And that's one of the things where, where, when I read it, I, w- I was a little surprised in saying that, uh, you know, canola oil being, being one of the mentioned, uh, quote unquote, healthy oils to use. I don't even know what a canola is actually. Yeah. Well, it's, it's corn oil. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, it's corn oil. I, I love that joke. So yeah, yeah it's, uh, no, you're, you're absolutely right. And there's, uh, I, I can tell you that currently, although, and I, 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 I did mention, you know, canola oil and that was, you know, ba- I don't remember which article specifically that I was, or which study I was pulling that from, but in my house now, uh, Olive oil is our go-to yeah. for pretty much everything, and I, I think that's a great. Now it's pricey, yeah, and it's not as shelf stable as say canola oil. But again, it's you run into the same thing. Shelf stability means you know yeah. is is natural food that we're supposed to eat shelf stable. Yeah, you know if you know a hundred years ago, if you slaughtered your own animal and picked your own fruits and vegetables, can you put them on a shelf and they'll be okay? No. Yeah. So if something's shelf stable, that probably tells you a little bit about it, yeah. right? Oh, um, for sure. With the exception of honey and olive oil, right? And, uh, well, honey's uh, honey's a little bit of a, a chemical miracle. It all, yeah. it has to do with the the pH level that it'll keep. You know, it'll it'll crystallize and it'll have some issues. But you know, they said that the the honey that they found in jars inside the Pharaoh's tomb could still be consumed. Yeah. No, that shit's. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's almost like fucking alien elixir. I think. Yeah. But, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, I mean, it, it, honey does seem, uh, it seems to be a, a strange, almost one-off. It's like the, the black hole of, of uh, nutrition right. and that a lot of it almost doesn't even make sense. But, um, you know, from an oil standpoint, again, I, you know, like there's, there's so many of these vegetable oils that are in almost fucking everything. I mean, if you go into a convenience store again, not just as a man-made processed bullshit that you're really not supposed to be eating. Um, but it's also, you know, if, if you look at almost every product, whether it's, you know, chips or crackers or, uh, even cookies or, you know, things that have some of the things that most people assume are bad, um, you know, sugar and, and especially, I mean, even the difference between re- just regular pure sugar and fucking corn syrup is huge. You know, right. uh, regular sugar is a lot healthier than, than corn syrup, but some of those nuances I think is where people get into trouble, especially on the health food side. Is that you know you can go into a health food store or, or whether you're ordering off Amazon or it's being recommended by some industry professional or whatever that says you know hey these seven grain stone ground crackers are are good crackers that you could eat or whatever and then they have fucking soybean oil in them right um, you know and that shit I mean I, like I said I've I've looked at I don't know how many goddamn studies that you know are are, are legitimate studies that are are you know in uh, antagonist form towards uh, you know, the FDA, the RDA, the USDA, you know, and, and you even mention it, um, to a certain extent and hear about it being more of a lobbyist thing. And I mean, it's essentially sure. bribing, um, you know, but that's the biggest problem I have with uh, a lot of nutrition advice is one is the inconsistency, but two is that, you know, there are a lot of medical professionals, in this industry professionals, nutritionists, dietitians that are trained at schools that are funded by, you know, Monsanto and these, you know, massive fucking corporations that, that don't have anything but a, a bottom line vested interest in, in what you learn and what you push out there. And you run into the same thing with vets. You know, a, a lot of vets don't understand jack fuck all about uh, canine nutrition and are recommending science diet and, you know, foods that, that corn gluten meal is the primary ingredient for a fucking carnivore. I mean, dogs right. are carnivores, you know, I mean, yeah. People argue carnivore versus herbivore, omnivore, you know, whatever. I mean, their mouth is filled with spikes and serrated triangles. Those motherfuckers are, are designed yeah. to eat whole dead <laughs> animals. Uh, you know, they, they should not be eating vegan diets. I mean, Mark Cuban just came out uh, in, in support of and, and in business partnership with some vegan dog food company. It makes me want to slap the fuck out of them. 
uh, you know, just, yeah, just it's, it, to me, it's crazy. It's why, why are people arguing against millions of years of evolution? Yeah. I, I mean, it's, and again, you know, to me, like, again, not trying to, to mince words or, or cherry pick things out of the book. It's just that and the, and the, you know, grass fed beef. Yes. Is better than, than red meat. But I, I truly believe cholesterol has a bad rap um, and, and we'll move, move away from the oils for a second. So, but yeah, no. So that's a great point. So let's, let's talk about that. So cholesterol does have a little bit of a bad rap um, because we need cholesterol. So, uh, and to, to kind of put this in perspective. So um, at one point, cause I have tried exclusionary diets and I, me- I mentioned in the book that for a while I, w- I did basically, I did a extreme carb restriction when I was in residency, I was eating less than 30 grams of carbs a day. So it was essentially an, an Adkins diet or, you know, a lot, not, not a carnivore diet, but it was pretty close. I was eating a lot of meat. My uh, cholesterol was absolutely pristine during that time. Mm-hmm. Um, when my cholesterol started to become an issue was when I got put on testosterone replacement, because now that I don't need that cholesterol as the <clears> backbone <throat> to make my own testosterone, it just circulates in my blood. So now it's an issue. So now it's something I have to keep my eye on a little bit. But yeah, to, uh, cholesterol A does get a bad rap. B, we've also discovered that, uh, and I didn't mention this in the book, and I probably should have, the probably the, the two biggest factors, and they're, it, it's debatable depending on who you talk to, or which factor is more important. One is nutrition, but the other is genetics. Yeah. And I know a guy who... Uh, a surgeon that I deployed with only ever ate turkey meat, only ever ate egg white omelets with no cheese. Like he did an egg, egg white omelet with uh, egg white and tomatoes. That was his breakfast every day. Uh, and I, I think he was also on a statin and his cholesterol was always borderline high, no matter what he ate. His, and he never ate butter, anything like that. Yeah. So there's a huge genetic component that kind of gets passed off in that. Well, yeah, I, I agree. You know, genetics certainly play a role. You know, this is my my synopsis of the research that I've gathered, uh, which is that I think j- just from the, the studies that I've seen and, and, you know, shit that I've dug into over the last few years is that, uh, you know, sugar overconsumption of carbohydrates in conjunction with, and, th- and this is, you know, a lot of people understand that and say, yeah, that makes sense. I think the biggest missing link with heart disease Artery, arteries being clogged, arthrosclerosis, uh, you know, heart attacks, et cetera, high, high cholesterol and people thinking that that, that means, you know, I'm going to have a heart attack is, you know, your, your arteries, when, when you are mineral and vitamin deficient, become extremely brittle. Mm-hmm. Uh, and cholesterol is the body's way to repair that. And so vitamin C, magnesium, vitamin D, and, and all of the other trace vitamins and minerals that your body needs at a, at a fairly high level to, to operate at capacity. When, when those aren't there, the arteries are brittle, and then your body keeps pumping cholesterol to try to repair it, and it does a shitty job because it's, it's kind of like trying to mop a, uh, a flooding fucking uh, bathroom floor while the, the toilet's still overflowing. Like, so it's just packing more and more, and, and that's primarily where heart attacks come from, not from eating egg yolks, not from eating mm-hmm. fatty ribeyes, not from eating, you know, it, it's a, it's such a disconnect. It seems, um, you know, from, from what the kind of, um, you know, advice that's out there. And I think if you think about it from, from kind of a historical biological context, I think that makes sense is that, you know, heart diseases and heart attacks now are, are the, are the thing that plagues, especially men in this country more than anything else. Mm-hmm. You know, but look at what what most people eat more than anything else is shit that they're not supposed to eat, and mm-hmm. they're and they're malnourished in terms of vitamins and minerals, and poisoning their bodies with these fucking uh, seed oils and and you know shelf stable vegetable oils that are essentially toxic. Uh, and and I think that those two things are are by far the most impactful in a in a negative uh, context to to men's health and 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 women's, but just overall human health, especially in Western cultures and and the, what pisses me off about it is is how that it, it's like there's pieces pulled from from different things that that get blamed on uh you know certain things that aren't really the culprit uh in, in my opinion and again i mean even if you take red meat as an example or butter and, and egg yolks is that you know red meat from you know or a ribeye from uh 
uh, if you've ever traveled on uh, Interstate 10 uh, in, in West Texas, like from a feedlot where there's 4,000 fucking cows in a room this size being fed shitty fucking grain that has mm -hmm. pesticides on it, mm -hmm. you know, cows that can't even, you know, move when they shit, you know, okay, that's a ribeye, right? And then you've got a grass-fed free-range cow that never has any grain whatsoever, as happy, as healthy, as out in the sunlight, you know, and, and gets, uh, you know, plugged from a fucking sniper tower, in, in which, you know, there are some beef purveyors that, that do it that way, so there's no cortisol in their bloodstream mm -hmm. when they're slaughtered. And, and you slap those two next to each other, and then you have a, a disingenuous assholes like uh, James Cameron and Arnold Schwarzenegger that are part of that uh, fucking special on Netflix called Game, Game Changer, I think. Yeah, which is... You know, which, which is right, wrought with fucking inaccuracies. Yeah, but, but so like data dredging. Yeah, but so yeah. If, if you feed somebody that fucking ribeye, the, the first one we're talking about, and then test their blood, it's going to be pretty fucked up because yeah. you're, you're eating unhealthy, fucked up, shitty animals. But on the same token, even for veganism, like if you're eating bananas and spinach and kale that you grew in your garden and you know every fucking thing that's in there, and, and more importantly, what's not in there, versus shit you buy at Walmart. Mm -hmm. Right. Or, or fucking go to, go to the dollar store and buy groceries that you're eating there. Like those are, are you know, you can't compare those two things, you know? And, and so, uh, because that makes such a big difference, you know, butter, as an example, egg yolks, you know, if, if the chickens are, are healthy and being fed, right, their egg yolks are healthy and, and they're, they're setting you up for success. If it's, you know, that, that same cow, the second cow that's a dairy cow and that's the one that's producing your cheese and butter that shit is actually good for you it's got a lot of things in there that, that you're not going to get from uh from essentially all vegetables um i'm not a all meat all cheese or all you know vegan uh you know hater or, or mm -hmm. what have you but i do think that there are there is a lot of misinformation that if you just think about it from kind of the the big picture historical context of of how many uh, places all over the world in the last 2000 years that never had any of the fucking problems that we have now. And you look at what they ate, they ate a lot of fucking meat, a lot of oils, cheeses, fucking, yeah, they, they would eat breads and grains and vegetables too, but not covered in fucking bullshit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and a lot of the incidences of, of skeletal health, not needing braces, kids not breaking bones easily, not having attention deficit disorders and, and mental problems because their brains are, are fed toxic fucking bullshit from the time they're, you know, born, mm -hmm. whether it's formula that's laden with bullshit or, or everything that they're fed at school and, and what have you. And it's just, you know, to me that that's a big component that, that seems to get lost in most mainstream publications when it relates to, to uh, diet and nutrition. Yeah, no, and I, I see uh, you're not the first person to bring this up to me. And in retrospect, I, I wrestled a lot with that chapter on how in-depth I should get. Yeah. And I, I think when it, when it came to red meat, and I, I hope it didn't come across, and I didn't mean for it to come across as like I'm dismissing red meat and I'm throwing this over in this bad pile. No. That's why I said, bed, bad, I, said, I said red meat gets a bad rap, partially deserved, yeah. right? Uh, and, I, you know, and I do eat red meat not as my primary protein source on a day-to-day -day basis. I do a lot of fish and poultry. Um, and you brought up a really important distinction is, you know, there you have the feedlot ribeye yeah. and the grass-fed ribeye. Well, and even with the fish and chicken, not to interrupt, but, you know, if you get chicken that's from a, a, a Tyson massive fucking farm versus, Same problem. versus yeah. a, a family farm. Well, and, you know. and, and chicken with skin on it has a tremendous amount of cholesterol in it and a yeah. lot of other shit in it that's, that's not good for you. Well, I, I guess, again, I, I would respectfully disagree. I, I think, um, you know, in, in fr from a big picture standpoint, if, if the animal is healthy, eating as, as much of that animal as possible is the best way to do it. And a lot of this is based off, there's, there's a guy named Weston A. Price. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but this is, he was a dentist that traveled uh, all over the fucking world. This was back about 100 years ago now at this point. Um, but studied, uh, you know, different indigenous tribes and, uh, you know, urban populations all over the world and, and looked at common denominators with the way kids, you know, what, they're, what they eat, what the adults eat, uh, how they're raised, and then the incidences of, of health problems. And in every case, not most, not half, I mean, every fucking instance, people that, that were eating, you know, just lean muscle tissue, mm -hmm. refined carbohydrates, sugar, you know, not, not getting sunlight, et cetera, needed braces, 
their kids broke bones, their skeletal structures were false, far smaller. And even if they were taking like their, because there were instances here in this country where Native American tribes, where there would be siblings, where one would go with a white family eating sugar and fucking bread, sugar butter or sugar margarine, white bread sandwiches. Mm -hmm. And the other one was eating liver and heart and tendons and fucking connective tissue and, and mm -hmm. almost all of the animal, you know, the flesh, every fucking thing. Um, you know, and, and there being just almost an unbelievable disparity be between the two of them. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I, I, I just, I think, you know, human nature, if, again, if you look at historically how many, uh, you know, different populations and cultures all over the world, when you look at what they ate, um, you know, based on, on where they're at and whatever animals are native to that population. But you look at, at what part of the animals they consumed, it was fucking all of it, mm -hmm. you know, bone marrow and, and fuck, I mean, everything, organ meats and, and you name it. And so, uh, I think that's one of our biggest problems is, is being super selective and not eating or organ meats and not eating the flesh and the, and the connective tissue. But it, the, to, to me, the key is it has to be a, a healthy animal. It absolutely does have to you be know. a healthy animal. And you hit, you hit on what, uh, on a, a key point that gets missed in a, in a lot of these studies and in the vegan studies and the carnivore studies and the studies that say cholesterol is bad and the studies that say cholesterol is good. And that's confounding variables is it's, it's not just, it's not just a steak. It's not just a person who eats steak. Yeah. It's what it, else are they eating? It's what else are they eating? And you talked about, are they getting sunlight? Are they getting enough exercise? Are they drinking enough water? Are they doing enough of the other right things because you can't look at an ice an isolated lifestyle decision yeah. and say this is the sole contributor to everything that's bad with you health wise right there's all of these other things and th and then add on to that and you, and you brought up the native american population we know there are genetic differences in in metabolism you know in predisposition for things like like diabetes and that's why you know when you try to assign a one size fits all diet of any kind yeah. on a massive scale, you're going to fail yeah. you know, for, for, for yeah. multiple reasons, sure. not, not just genetic reasons, but also, you know, lifestyle reasons and yeah. vocation reasons and everything else. But no, yeah. I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad you brought these points up. And again, you know, I tried, I tried not to be um, universally condemning yeah. of anything. I tried to look at this from a point of view of, and, and when it comes to the, the, and the reason I didn't make the distinction between uh, all right, let's, you know, I didn't do like a whole sub chapter on, all right, you're going to eat red meat. So let's talk, let's, let's walk your way through that is trying to keep the book as, uh, as brief and concise as possible. And it's, it's similar to the argument that I, that I've recently had with some physicians about the mask issue, right? Yeah. Cause so what, what's the, what's the data say, if you look at, if you look at the mask data from the top down, it says masks aren't working. And that's what I said. And I took a lot of heat for it. And they're like, no, 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 no. But if you're wearing N95s, and I'm like, okay, who are you seeing wearing N95s? Well, we the, all, you know, yeah, I mean, the other thing, too, which I think you can appreciate uh, with a quick pivot is that, you know, with, with everybody is that, you know, it's not even about what mask or how it's being worn. It's just the fact that your face is covered. Yeah. You know, because even with an M95, like you can appreciate this as a surgeon is that, you know, if you walked into an OR and you pulled an M95 out of your back pocket that you'd used on the last 17 fucking surgeries, right. <laughs> like w would anybody find that acceptable? No, they wouldn't. Yeah. You know, well, the, shit doesn't transfer in, in an OR any easier or, or slower, you know, any, any more or less there than it does out at a fucking 7-Eleven, you know, so even more so, like even if you're using the right mask, like unless you're scrubbing in gloving up properly putting on a brand new mask you go into the establishment you handle your business you come out and, and you you take it off in that order and put it in a sharps container and then it's being treated as a biohazard and contaminated then none of it fucking matters anyway mm -hmm. you know and so like to me i I've, i haven't understood that from fucking day one i, I mean not only are they not effective they're I, I think they're worse than nothing because if you watch anybody who wears one what do they do they finger fuck it all the time you know, and so if I, let's just say that, that I have it and I put this mask on that I've had for three months, you know, and been using it the whole fucking time. Well, 
just by pulling it out, if, if it's active and I put it up to my face and I do this, now it's all over my fucking hands, mm -hmm. right? I wouldn't have put my hands to my face right before I walked into a store had I not been putting on this nasty fucking face diaper that's now contaminated, right. and now that shit's all over my hands. And then I go in, and I'm pulling it down, and it's falling down, and I'm moving it, and I sneeze, and then I'm, it's fucking my ear up. and you know, It's like it's, it's forcing people to breathe in CO2 and constantly put their hands to their face using a piece of cloth that's for sure not fucking sterile. Yeah. You know, I am dumbfounded. I had this argument with uh, with our, my kid's family physician. He was all for it, and I brought up all these points. He had, he had nothing to say about it. Just, well, it's better than nothing. Like, no, it's not. Like, no, it's, it's, not. it's actually worse than nothing. You know, and I don't know how as a as a medical professional, you can fucking sleep at night knowing what you know and recommending dumb shit like that. I feel the same way about the vaccine. Like, if it was a shing like shingles vaccine, that makes sense. Fucking measles, yeah. If it, if it keeps me from getting it, then it makes sense to get it. If it doesn't keep me from getting it or giving it to somebody, why do you give a fuck whether or not I have it? Like, and again, like I don't know a single industry professional or, or a medical, uh, you know, personnel professional that has any argument that says, yeah, here's why it makes sense. That that actually makes fucking sense. I mean, n none of it makes any fucking sense to me, but. Uh, I digress. Uh, so diet and nutrition, we'll move on. I, I know we're getting a little short on time. Uh, chapter five, fitness. Uh, yeah, so uh, fitness, uh, which for me was probably the easiest chapter to write. And uh, the important thing that I wanted to emphasize in that is uh, is not to wing it, that you have to have a plan. If you And if you don't know... If you don't know what you don't know, then you need to seek uh, some advice on that. Because if we look, you know, we talked we talked about this before. The way we did physical training 10, 20 years ago didn't look anything like the way that we do it now. Yeah. You know, we're constantly making advancements in that. I think of the ridiculous way that we did PT in the Ranger Battalion in yeah. the 80s. <laughs> it was just moronic. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm surprised that everybody just wasn't yeah. borderline dead by the time they were 30 years old. So. Yeah. Have a plan, decide what your goals are, uh, have a comprehensive plan, and get some expert help on it um, that aligns, some expert help that aligns with your goals. Not just going into a CrossFit box and going, I'm going to do the WAD. Yeah. Well, maybe the, maybe the WAD, maybe you don't need to be doing power cleans. Maybe yeah. that's not what your fitness goals are about. Or, or trying to ma max, max your fucking snatch. Like, yeah, or kip. You, yeah. Know, you know, I can't, I still can't kip. Yeah. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to do the, the Murph next year, so I got to learn to kip. I mean, I, that's, I, have a, I have a heartburn with kipping pull-ups, honestly. I, I, I get the their philosophy behind it's technically the same amount of travel, ergo it's the same amount of work. It's not, though. Uh, I, I would, and, and to me, the, where the irony or almost contradiction is, is, is in that, you know, in, in other exercises, you know, super, super strict, correct form is is biblical. Right. right? Like in, in, all of not the, in, in all of the <laughs> Olympic lifts, like it has to be exactly this way. Uh, you know, but in a pull-up, it's whatever's the, the, the easiest way to get that fucking, uh, you know, weight from one, one spot to the next. And, right. uh, and I, I think it's a, I think it's a fumble on CrossFit's part. That's just my take, but, um, all right. Chapter six, martial arts. Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is how I sum up that, that yeah. chapter uh, <laughs> briefly is I, I think martial arts are important. It's, it's, it's great for mindset. Um, and it's also great to give you a gauge is, you know, what is everything that I'm doing in my fitness routine? Is this, is this actually showing some applicability in how I can move in, in how my cardio is and in everything else? I also just love the way that the martial arts, it, you know, it has discipline instilled in it and it deconstructs your ego and yeah. lets you kind of rebuild it from the yeah. ground up. Uh, in terms of martial arts, as it relates to the, the post 40 year old, injury prone guy uh any any asterisk or or additional to that don't do capoeira or yeah. some <laughs> weird shit where you're going to be jumping around uh i don't i don't i don't spar striking really at all i'll yeah. hit the bag i'll hit mitts what, what about even like with uh in jujitsu like rolling with a 19 year old di you know division one wrestler white belt yeah and that's and i've been there that's yeah. and that's happened to me um I, recently, I, I had a conversation uh, last week with John Danaher, and I asked him specifically about that. I said, how do you approach – John's 53. Yeah. 
And I said, how do you approach your training differently? He, he just said, moved down by where you're at, right? Yep. Yeah. yeah, he's, he's training at, at Henzo Gracie Austin now. So his, his classes are amazing. It's like it's like being in the presence of John the Baptist. Yeah, earlier. that's awesome. Um, I, I'd say Jesus, but that would be sacrilegious. So. <laughs> um, he said, uh, John said, um, the most important thing that you can learn <laughs> is the ability to say no. Yeah. That's, and, that's a pretty and, dialed in fucking uh, yeah, impression. It's, yeah, it's, and that's exactly <laughs> how he said it. Is it, you have to you have to know when to say no, and that might mean. So there's there there is a friend of mine at my gym uh, who just got promoted to purple belt. He's a great grappler, really aggressive, really strong. Outweighs me by probably 35, 40 pounds. Okay, he loves rolling with me. Yeah, because I will I will I will go hard when I roll with him. I've come to the conclusion I shouldn't be rolling with them yeah. because of the weight difference, the strength difference, and the age difference. Because I, I started to realize every time I wake up in pain the next day, yeah. it's because I rolled hard with him. Yeah. And there's a couple other people in my gym, and I and I I had been told this before by my professor that hey, you know these, you know, and I had answered that with, uh, I won't start standing with it. I, with a young white belt especially if it's a young white belt I don't know yeah. I absolutely will not not start standing yeah. with them cuz I don't know what crazy shit they're going to do yeah. um but yeah it, the ability to say no and to know your limits not be afraid to take a rest round here and there yeah um cuz you don't have it, you don't have you have to prove to yourself but you don't have to prove it to anybody else and it's important that you continue to prove to yourself yeah. right I talk about that in that chapter yeah. but don't think you're there to prove that you're getting better. You're not there to prove that you're better than that 22 year old who is going to do fine. Even if he does get injured and wrestle for four years or whatever yeah. it might be. Yeah. Which dovetails well into chapter seven recovery. Recovery is so neglected and so not important. So, uh, this week, great example. Um, I didn't work out Wednesday cause, uh, we had a SWAT training day. I decided to take yesterday off. I normally never do that. And I talk about that in the book that I try to never take 48 hours off. My hips given me a little bit more problem this week. So I knew that recovery all of a sudden became a lot more important. So an Epsom salt bath and some yoga was the extent of my physical training yesterday. Yeah. Recovery is so important and so neglected because we want to push ourselves. We have this mental block that tells us if I'm not in the gym working, I'm, I'm atrophying, yeah. I'm losing, but you're making gains on the days that you rest. So resting properly, understanding the difference between active recovery and passive recovery and how you can adjust that and the length of time that you should normally recover. You know, this week is going to be three days with, without to me tomorrow. I'm going to go fairly hard. Sunday, I'm going to go even a little bit harder. And then yeah. Monday will be a full scale workout for me. And I think in with that too, one thing that, um, just like how it's typically underrated is is the the variance that can can and needs to be adjusted based on what you need based on so many other things that aren't even workout related it's mm -hmm. you know what's going on stress work wise what's yep. going on nutrition wise how you know is your sleep fucked up there's a lot of other factors that that may make you need more recovery or or need less you know based on on what all those other things are which yep. uh, I, I think is a really important point but um chapter eight supplements I'm assuming you'd throw TRT into there, right? Yeah, uh, TRT is in there. Although I don't, uh, I, I mentioned it briefly in passing. You know, specifically what I wanted that chapter to revolve around is more nutritional supplements. You know, yeah. like line, lining up your GNC bottles or whatever yeah. it is. Ninety percent of what's out there on the market is crap. Yeah, you know, it's uh, most people are taking shit that they don't need to be taking. That there's. Uh, questionable data if there's data at all on whether or not it works yeah um i've done a deeper and deeper dive over the years to ascertain what is out there that has data behind it everything that i mentioned in that chapter 100 there is data to show that it is beneficial that doesn't mean i 100 covered everything that is yeah. beneficial yeah. i know there are things out there that i didn't talk about because they haven't come across my radar yet yeah um so well, that's that changes so much anyway it, it, yeah it evolves so so much yeah and, uh, you know, the way that I'm choosing to get my beta alanine or whatever it is at, at this point might be different six months from now or a year from now. But uh, I want people to recognize that 
And it's hard. It's really hard for the layman to do, the layperson to do, because there's so much crap out there, you yeah. know, and there and there's so much false advertising because it's a it's a business. Yeah. So, um, you know, I tell people if you want if you want a bunch of boring articles, email me. I will send you all the boring fucking articles yeah. on all the stuff that I talk about in that chapter. I have it all saved. More than happy to send it to you. Um, I didn't. People have asked me why didn't you put the footnotes in that chapter. That was a long discussion that I had with my my publisher and my editor. Yeah. And they're like, look, man, 99% of people don't read those. They just get in the way. So if, if I were you, I wouldn't bother. Yeah. And I'm like, you know what? I don't, I can't think of a book that I've, you know, maybe I make a note of it just to look it up later and vet it on my own. But yeah. I think most people aren't, aren't going to look at that. But yeah. supplements can be, you know, the, the argument against supplements is always, uh, well, we've done every 10 years we do this study and people don't need to take vitamins and and there's, I mentioned in there, there's confounding variables in that. They're usually not taking a lot of things into account. And also, it's never really being adequately studied on people over the age of 40. They're yeah. looking at an average, usually 20 to 30-something, or an aggregate population that might span many years. But, the, but when you boil it down to the, to the mean and the median uh, of what the age group was, it's people in their 30s. So as we get older, I think supplements and, and taking supplements intelligently becomes more important. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, chapter nine, the, the big one, health maintenance. Health maintenance, so neglected in the United States, and we, um, we don't do what we should do. We wait until we have a problem to get that problem solved because the medical community has failed us and has convinced us that you just do what you do. You just keep shoveling that crap down your gullet and not exercising and drinking soda pop all day. And we're here for you when you're sick and you just come and we have, here, here's a pill. You can still keep living like shit, but you're going to take this pill and you're going to be fine. Yeah. And that's not the answer. So you need to, you need to address these problems before they occur. Cancer screenings, colonoscopies, skin cancer, um, just having a conversation with your doctor, looking yeah. at, you know, at, What's, what does this blood work mean? Yeah. What does this mean to me? This is what runs in my family. What should I be concerned with? Have a real relationship. But at the, at the end of the day, I want everybody to take ownership of their health care. Yeah. Nothing drives me, drives me crazier than, but, but I know that we, I don't blame the patient. I blame, uh, I blame medical providers. Somebody comes into the ER. They don't know their medical history. They don't know their family history. They say they've never had a surgery. You lift up the gown. There's a zipper scar on their chest. What medicines do you take? They hand me a Walmart bag full of bottles. They don't even have, they didn't even make a list. This is a person that's been convinced that they're on autopilot. They don't need everything that happens under the hood. They don't even need to worry about. They'll just pull in for their oil change when the light goes on, right? Yeah. And uh, people need to get away from that mindset. Nobody cares about you as much as you. Take ownership of your health. Know what's wrong with you. Know what's know what runs in your family. Know what medications you're on. While why you are on them, and if there is an alternative, maybe you don't need to be on medications. Yeah. There might be a little lifestyle change that you could have made, but and your doctor maybe mentioned it, maybe he didn't. Yeah. But you know, it's you know, it's not. It might be average to be 50 years old. Uh, I'm watching my blood sugar and I'm on a blood pressure medicine, and I'm on something else. Statin. That's average, but that's not normal. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be normal. Yeah. And again, I mean, back to diet and nutrition. I mean, obviously there are a lot of other factors, but I, I truly believe that most of it is from consuming things. You're just not, your body's not designed to fucking consume. Yeah. You know? but, uh, yeah. Uh, great, great info for sure. Uh, last but not least is uh, your tribe. The tribe is is really important and at the in the in the 21st century in 2021 having a tribe a good tribe has at the same time become harder and also easier so it, it's a lot harder to seek out because of the lifestyles that we lead um people that are willing to suffer with you and do difficult things and push you um in your everyday life but for the thousand and one things that are terrible about the internet one of the good things is it is a place to find a tribe yeah. whether it's through a reddit forum or a facebook forum or uh, or some other group and i'm in a i'm in a few i'm in uh i'm in uh i'm in a my zone group because i wear a my zone heart monitor i'm in uh dakota's own the dash forum all these other groups that motivate each other and keep each other accountable and you can go to with questions 
I'm in a bunch of jujitsu forums and you lift each other up. And that's the great thing about a tribe is we're all responsible for lifting the tribe up as a whole. But when one tribe member starts to lag behind, you're going to get that help. Yeah. And then you're also going to be held accountable. If you're always the, the one that we have to pull up, yeah. you're going to get the, hey, hey, man, you're conversation. Ta- taped up right? behind the fucking right. woodshed. Yeah. And then you're going to have to, exactly. Then you're going to have to do it on your own. So that's the, the best thing about the tribe is the, is the accountability aspect of it. I, uh, I couldn't agree more. And I, I like the adage, not even the adage, just the, the principle of, you know, the five people that you spend the most time with you know, are, are going to be the, the biggest reflection on, uh, you know, your life and how you live it and what's important to you and all those things. And so, you know, choose those five people that, that you spend the most time with. You absolutely you know, really are who you surround yourself yep. with. Yep. Uh, which is why I surround myself with porn stars all the time. You know, that's a, that's a great way to live. You know what I tell people all the, all the yeah. time. I said this at a, I said this at a, a sheepdog event when I was still working with Tim. I said, uh, if, if you look around and you're the toughest one of your friends, you need to find fucking tougher friends. Yeah. Same with the, with the smarter, right? If you're the smartest guy, but the, the bitch of that is there's always got to be one guy that's the smartest in every group. Right. So, yeah. But you know, maybe that means you have, you, you have an ancillary group you yeah. know, over here on the side, yeah. you know, and you can be a member of more than one group, but you need to yeah. be challenging. If, if all your tribe is doing is feeding into your confirmation bias all the time. Yeah. Like if every time you have a conversation, like, see, this was great. Cause we were talking, <clears throat> we have some disagreements on the nutrition chapter. I love that. Yeah. If this was just sitting here and like, Echo and chamber. with you stroking my ego, you know, I'd walk out of here, you know, uh, then, then my development stops. Yeah. And it's, it's important to disagree on things. Yeah. I've got a lot of friends that I disagree with on yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. And I, I mean, not that I like to argue, but I, I think it's imperative. And I think one of the biggest things that's lacking specifically in our political institutions is having your positions challenged, Yep. you know, and, and, I think there's, I think both groups are guilty of it. I think one group is, is more guilty of it than the other, but uh, just because there's such an, an echo with the media, mainstream media and pop culture and, and Hollywood and, and our current, current government, uh, I won't even uh, pollute the term leadership by calling them leaders, but, uh, but you know, they're, they're constantly surrounded by yes men and, and people that just agree with them and, and blow smoke. And so when somebody doesn't, you know, and again, I run into this with the vaccine stuff or some of the mass stuff sounds like you, you have too, especially with the mass stuff being in, in that community is that, you know, it, it's like they, they don't have a good answer for it. And, and then they just, you know, start yelling and throw, you know, personal attacks or, uh, you know, bait and switch and fucking bring something else up or, or uh, you know, just get pissed and, and wow, well, we just have to agree to disagree and, and fucking storm out or whatever. But but yeah, I mean that like if you can't defend your position, then you ought to fucking rethink it. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, yeah exactly. And uh, that's one of the the things that drives me absolutely crazy. And I've seen it. And I'll and f- so full disclosure, I'm vaccinated. My family's vaccinated. Mm-hmm. Based and uh, and I still think that was the right thing to do. I am fully against vaccine mandates. Yeah. Okay, uh, for all the reasons that you can possibly imagine, um, based on my review of the phase three trials and my review of what happened with the early data out of Israel, when the time came, as soon as I was able to get it, I wanted to get it knowing that I'm, if you know, 55 years old, even though I'm healthy, that I'm in a, in a higher risk category. But when, like you say, when I see the arguments on both sides of this, you know, people that like they, they throw up these sensationalistic, ah, but what about this? And then you go, okay, well let's, let's dissect that down. And then they, they pivot. Well, that wasn't my point. Well, then why did you bring it up? Yeah. You know, I, I had somebody tell somebody who didn't, who was, who was uh, against vaccines say, uh, I know 12 people that have died from the vaccine. Okay. Let me, I'm going to need their names and I, and I will, I will call pathologists and I will put, well, okay. I don't know 12 people, yeah. but at least I've heard second and third hand reports from at least a dozen people. Okay. So you don't even know if it's officially 12. Yeah, yeah. You don't know how many of those people. Well, but that wasn't the point. Well, then why did you bring up the point? Yeah. If well, you brought it, it up, it was a point. <laughs> it, well, it, was, it, was, it was, and this is on, on every side is that it's a point until you question it and, and make them prove it. And then they can, I mean, for me that again, the vaccine is, is very simple. I, the, the last thing I would say I am is anti-vaccination. I have a shitload of them. There's a you lot. To. Yeah. There's, there's, you know, some that I didn't even want to get anthrax being one of them. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, 
Uh, but I got it anyway because I was in the military, and that's part of the fucking gig. Uh, in this case, again, it, it would be very different, and 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 I can tell you unequivocally that if if it had a basically hundred percent or really goddamn close percentage rate to to keeping you from contracting it mm -hmm. and keeping you from transmitting it, my opinion would be completely different. Mm -hmm. But because that's not the case, to me that that is the one driving force behind at least my uh, aversion to getting it myself is that, you know, no, but based on that, the same reason I, I you know, am not going to get flu shots uh, for the same reason is, is that, you know, to me, my, my risk factor of, of actually becoming ill and, and transmitting it isn't any different in getting it uh, fr from my standpoint. And so if that's the case, then whether or not I get it bears no impact on somebody who's gotten it. And, and again, like you being a doctor, you, you tell me if I'm wrong and, and explain to me how I'm wrong then is that, you know, me getting the vaccine or not getting the vaccine, the way I understand it has no bearing on whether or not you get sick or not. Correct. So, uh, you ask different people, you're going to get a different answer to that question. So my answer to that question is because I'm back, because I'm vaccinated, if you were to ask me, if this was the initial, you're still in the deciding phase of this, I would have a conversation with you. And what I would probably tell you is, Mike, even, even at your age, even though you're not as old as me, if I were you, knowing what I know, yes, I would get it. Yeah. And but, but ultimately, I respect your decision. And I'm not going to not interact with, with you yeah. because you don't have it. Because here's, because here's the deal. I have it. I have interacted with people. I have rolled jujitsu. So this close to somebody's face mm -hmm. who the next day found out they had COVID yeah. two people, <clears throat> two people found out they had COVID the next day. Yeah. Was I worried about it? Did I run to get tested? Was I mad at them? No, I'm vaccinated. They got it. I didn't. Okay. That's an anecdotal case. Anec anecdotal evidence is not evidence, right? So that doesn't necessarily mean that I couldn't get it if it was a different variant or something like that. Um, I can tell you that, you know, it, it, just as I was looking at the data in Israel early on, I continue to look at Israel, and it's concerning because now it does look like, and so, and we don't know what this is. Is this, is this waning antibodies? You know, they say that the T cell issue is supposed to take over. Uh, now they're seeing more and more cases. We do know that the cases of those that are vaccinated, they do have, uh, we're seeing a lower death rate, a lower hospitalization rate. So you're going to get a milder case of it because of that. So I still think, you know, if I dial back the clock or had a time machine to talk to myself, then I would still do it. I understand. I a hundred percent understand where the pause comes from in that, uh, it's been sensationalized a little bit, but yeah, this, this happened really fast. I understand why that's a concern. Yeah. We could do a whole podcast, me talking about why it, it, didn't concern me, but I understand why it's a concern for you. Yeah. I understand when you see the numbers that people are still getting it. So why should I get it? People are still transmitting it. I understand why that's a concern for you. And I respect that. I respect your body autonomy yeah. to make the decision to say that you're not going to get it. And I don't, I'm not going to, I will interact with a room full of unvaxxed people. I have no problem with that yeah. again. And, and if I walk out of that with COVID, I'm still not going to blame any of them for it, right? Because yeah. they they made a decision uh, that's well within their rights based on the information that they had. It's not the decision that I made, but I respect that decision. Yeah. I, I guess for me, you know, severity of symptoms, uh, number of breakthrough cases using Israel data, you know, using data, period, uh, other, other than one simple fact is that you know, there, there are still a, a lot of people, you know, to, to call it a breakthrough case, I, I think is disingenuous. I mean, there's millions of people who are vaccinated who have gotten COVID after they've been fully vaccinated. To me, that, that is the one thing that all of that other white noise that people argue about and they get so far into the weeds where they're really arguing about shit that kind of doesn't matter, you know, mm -hmm. or, or it's even subjective. Right. Right. Like this isn't like, can you still get the va or can you still get the virus when you're vaccinated? Yes. Can you still transmit it? Yes. To me, it, it really is just that simple. Like all that other bullshit. I mean, like, again, like you can argue till you're blue in the face. The fact is, is that that's the case. Now, if that wasn't the case, it's a totally different conversation. 
You know, we take tetanus, right? Tet- the tetanus shot makes fucking sense. Like if I step on a rusty nail that has tetanus and I still have, you know, a flip of a coin's chance as to whether or not I get it, no, I'm probably not going to get the fucking tetanus shot. Same thing. Like it doesn't have anything to do with who was president, who is now, who's recommending it, who's not. That's just me thinking of it 100% from Mike Ritland's fucking perspective is that if it doesn't guarantee or real goddamn close to me not getting it, I'm not taking it, mm-hmm. period. Like, and, and I don't give a fuck what it is. You can, you can uh, replace COVID with Ebola, right? If there's an Ebola, you know, like Ebola came to Dallas with 2014 or whatever, and there's this huge fucking oh, scare. Yeah, I remember that. The mortality rate with Ebola is a whole different fucking story. But even with that, if, the, if this new, let's say Ebola was, was corona and sweeping the country and killing 40% of the fucking people that got it, which, you know, corona, yes, it's killed people, uh, but percentage-wise, you know, it's, it's very, very low. There's 13 other things that kill people in much higher percentage points than, uh, than the coronavirus does that we don't do anything about eating sugar, blah, 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 all the shit that we just talked about. And so my point is, is that if you, if you replace those two things, even still, like here's a vaccine, you know, that doesn't keep you from getting it or transmitting it, then I'm not getting it. You know, I mean, plain and simple, like that's just my choice. Uh, and it should be my choice. You know, um, I feel the same way about school vaccinations is that, yeah, like my kids are vaccinated, but if you don't want to have your kid get vaccinated, if the vaccine works and is worth getting, then it shouldn't fucking matter whether or not the other kid is right. I mean, am I, Missing something about how the fuck vaccines work or are supposed to work? Well, d- I mean, depending on what it, what it is we're talking about, and so and so the arguments that come up, <laughs> we're getting into a whole a whole vaccine. Well, thing I, I guess just in the interest of keeping it real fucking simple from a Corona standpoint, then yeah. So if we're now if we're talking about Corona, if we're not going to talk about other stuff, because um, because the argument on the other stuff, just to touch on it briefly, is you know, it's well, certain kids can't get vaccinated because they might have, you know, uh, an autoimmune disorder or something like that. So to protect them because of the interest of herd immunity, that's a whole different conversation that we could get into. The, and I, I don't, although there's some bleed, the traditional, and, and you even mentioned it, you're not an anti-vax person, you know, uh, the, there's a little bit of bleed over from the t- traditional anti-vaccine arguments into this argument. But a lot of this is a whole new argument. You know, and again, you know, that argument being it's, um, it's the, it was the, you know, the MRNA is the first vaccination of its kind. So we don't know what it's going to do long-term. I understand that, you know, I, it, from a risk assessment standpoint, I'm okay with it. And that was a decision that I made, uh, you know, from the standpoint of the, the speed at which this occurred, uh, the, the problem is on both sides, but I, I will say that, and this is a conversation that I've had with physicians. When physicians are very dismissive of people who don't and, and want to put labels on the people that don't want to get the vaccine, I tell them you're you're missing a really important opportunity to un, to a understand where these people are coming from and b have that conversation. And I've had a couple conversations with retired SF guys who 100% were not going to get the vaccine until I had that conversation with them. And in the and 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 them contact me later, man. Thank you so much. I'm like, you don't don't thank me. You you made this decision. All I told you is what I thought, and I emailed you where I was getting my information from. You made that decision. I did not convince you. Yeah. You know, I gave you some information you might not have otherwise had, and I was open and honest about it. But this whole the whole COVID thing has been, from an information standpoint, has been so mishandled. I understand. I understand the distrust of the CDC. I understand the distrust of Fauci. I understand the distrust of this medical system as a whole. And now their answer to that is now doubling down and just, Oh, fuck you. I, because I said, so yeah. here's a goddamn mandate. Yeah. I mean, I mean that for sure makes it worse, but again, like I, I can very easily, easily separate myself from all of that shit, mm-hmm. you know, and, and you to, can, not everybody can. Well, I, I mean, but, but either way yeah. is that like at, at the end of the day, does it work or does it not work? Like, is it going to guarantee that you don't get it? No. Is it going to guarantee that you don't transmit it? No. So to me, it's it's exactly like a flu shot that way. You know, people say, don't compare it to the flu. Well, fuck you. That Like, the, the numbers are very consistent in terms of the percentage of the population that's at risk, the age groups and, and uh, you know, demographics that, that are at the highest risk are the exact are exactly the same. And the mortality rate is real goddamn close, right? 
Uh, not I mean, really. Percentage wise, right? The, the, like, like if, if I was to get the flu, the chances of me dying oh, okay. from the oh, flu. Oh, I thought, I thought you meant the, the mortality rate. Okay. Well, well, I, mean, I thought you meant mortality rate among vaccinated against COVID and unvaccinated. No, no. I'm just saying like. Mortality it, rate fl flu to COVID. Yeah, I see, I see yeah, where you're coming from. Is that if, if I get either of those, I have a 99.7% chance of not dying from either one of them. Yeah. The, the big thing about COVID, the, th the thing that makes it different than the flu is the infectivity rate. So the infectivity rate, the average infectivity rate, um, and it, somebody's going to say I'm an idiot because I'm explaining it wrong, but basically, typically, a person who gets the flu gives the flu to one other person mm -hmm. on average. A person that gets COVID gives it to 2.5 people on average. So the infectivity rate is a little bit higher. So, I mean, so again, I would say this is that, you know, if you're worried about it, get the vaccine then. Like yeah. if the vaccine works as well as it's supposed to, mm -hmm. right, which is debatable based on the data that you see, then get the shot and it doesn't matter if I get it or not. Yeah. Right. I mean, because to me, like you again, with the with the demographics and all the numbers being close enough to where you can you could substitute Corona for flu. Is that you know no different than me getting a flu shot? Isn't a guarantee that I'm not going to get the flu, and there's no guarantee that I'm not going to to give it to anybody. So there's you know, but you could also say how many people have died because you got the flu and gave it to that other person. Mm -hmm. There's probably a lot of them, uh, you know, but there's no mandates for flu vaccines. Now that may change now. Now, now that the public's perception is based, you know, I would say largely and almost solely off of of fear um mm -hmm. you know but i just think it's it, it's such a divisive and and uh it's incredibly divisive you know, pr problem that we have in this country where like people have such a fucking hard time and i talk about this in my book it, it's a recurring theme in every chapter is mind your own fucking business the problem is people view that as well you walking around with that is my business like but no it isn't you know again like if you're worried about it get vaccinated or stay the fuck home like if, if you're that worried about it you have the choice to not go to a fucking basketball game or to mm -hmm. not go out to eat or whatever you know um and and i think that's the that's the the principle that i have the biggest problem with is is it's just like with the statues or the the the, the oppressive fucking speech that pisses me off and so you shouldn't be allowed to say it is that you're basically saying if you don't live the way this group of people says you should live, then then you shouldn't be able to do it, you know. And it's like with great freedom comes great responsibility, and and you either have it or you don't. And and right now we we just frankly fucking don't, you know. Yeah. I mean that that's the reality of it. But no, and I think I I made a post. This was probably over a year ago now. I said uh, I'm trying to remember exact exactly how I worded this. I said, uh, it was, oh, it was, uh, it wasn't 4th of July. It was way back before that. It might've been like Thanksgiving last year when they were, you know, still this whole, well, people shouldn't get together in groups larger than 10 or 11 or some shit. Right. And I made a post and I said, uh, so I said, you having a get together of 12 people does not make you a fucking freedom fighter. And you calling somebody about your neighbor who had 12 people doesn't make you a fucking concerned community leader. Both of you need to throw off your fucking patting yourself on the back. I am self-righteous because I'm, oh, look at me. Look what I'm doing. Fuck you. I'm going to have 12 people over. Fuck you. I'm going to call the city because you had 12 people over. Yeah. Both of those people are Karens and they fucking annoy me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So just... Like you say, just mind your own fucking business. If you if if I go if I go in somewhere and I see people with masks on, I don't stink eye them, you know, like oh you're still one of those hey sheeple you're still wearing masks. Yeah. But when we were still wearing masks and H E B required me to wear a mask, and the one guy who didn't have a mask and was walking around like I'm just waiting for an H E B employee to tell me I I need to put a mask on. I didn't look at him like, okay, you're an, you're an idiot and you're going to get us all sick. I didn't avoid, you know, if you see somebody that's doing the opposite of what you want to do, just don't interact with yeah. that person. Well, yeah. And, and the problem I have, again, I'll, I'll use that same analogy with, uh, first of all, I agree. Like wear a mask, don't wear a mask, fucking get vaccinated. Don't get vaccinated. Shove a fucking bottle up your ass or a broomstick. I don't give a fuck. You do yeah. you, and, and and I'm happy to stay yeah. the fuck out of your way. Don't knock on my door wanting to talk about it. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think that parallel exists. Is is that again? It's that slippery slope, right? Is that the 
the statue is the the word is the flag is the mm -hmm. fucking it just keeps going yeah with this it's the same way is that you know again if you look at the data how many people have died from COVID? even that's fucking debatable when you look at the comorbidities and and you know what really fucking killed them versus not and hospital data being yeah. manipulated i'm not a conspiracy theorist but my, my point is is that it's a very small percentage of the population there are and and we've talked about them heart disease, cancer, fucking, you know, I mean, all there's a, a host of other issues that kill way more fucking people that, that you could just as easily, or in my opinion, even more easily based on the numbers alone, justify making certain things illegal. Cottonseed oil, as an example, sugar, you know, fucking caffeine in certain amounts and certain, I mean, there's a, there's a ton of fucking things that you could do under that same mentality methodology or, or principled approach to protecting the public that isn't being done mm -hmm. on problems that are far fucking worse than the coronavirus right. now i'm not advocating for for the government to step in and make 32 ounce fucking dr peppers illegal like they try to do in, in new york and what have you but my point is is that tr trying to to do it for just this one slice of thing that now has become everybody's goddamn religion or anti-religion to me, is the beginning of the end of our, our civilization, or it gives you a glimpse into how Nazi Germany was formed, and that there there was such a division over something that ultimately was manufactured that it turned a fucking country in on itself, you know, and, and led to to what happened. And, and a lot of people would say, well, that's a ridiculous comparison. It's not. It's I mean, it's it's the start of of how that happened. You know, I mean, most people would would look at Nazi Germany and say, how the fuck did that ever happen? Well, that's how it happened. You know, is it groups of people? They didn't just wake up. Yeah, they didn't just wake up one morning and decide to build and, Auschwitz. And that shit was going yeah, on. No, yeah. I mean, you it, know, it was it was a, it was a but, gradual thing. But that's how it happened: is dehumanizing, you know, and, and pitting groups of people against each other based on trivial bullshit that's manufactured and, and gets so heated to the point where I mean, you're even seeing it where like people are cheering or or wishing. People that, like you didn't get vaccinated, and you got COVID. Fuck! I hope you die so I can put a, a yeah, tick that, in that column. Like that's a poisonous fucking attitude. So not that that bothers me especially on the fact that I've seen physicians kind of and and people in healthcare pick up that mantle. Yeah, and that really fucking bothers me. Yeah. And and one of them in particular, uh, I'm Facebook friends with, uh, and I don't. I ended up being Facebook friends with a few physicians that I don't. I don't know professionally. It's like friends of friends type thing. That's why I don't accept a lot of friend requests anymore. But one in particular, like made posted, did one of these repost diatribes of, <clears throat> of like, Oh, if you're not going to fucking listen to me, if you know, fuck you, you yeah. know, just stay out of my hospital type thing. Yeah. And I said, okay, so, you know, we knew for years how HIV was transmitted. When you had people come in, were you, was that your first question yeah. was, you know, well, were you wearing a condom? Yeah. I mean, same thing with smoking, right? Like, yeah, yeah. We, hey, you we know smoke, what that but is. I'm not treating you. Oh, I'm not. Yeah. You, oh, you got COPD and you smoke. Sucks to be you. Yeah. You right. know, it's there's. You know, oh, you're eating at the McDonald's drive-through every day, and now we're amputating your foot. Sucks to be yeah, you. I'm not doing it. Fuck off. Yeah. It's it, it, the, this isn't. You know, and a lot of these things is you know so so let's look at a lot of these things. People had a lot more knowledge and a lot more that data. they, they should have known better, yeah. right? You know, smoking is a great yeah. example, Decades right? Decades of data. Yeah. Anybody who smokes in 2021. You know it's bad right, for you're you. You're playing Russian roulette. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> you basically are, right? Yeah. So, and that's 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 been known for a while. So then, you know, the, to then blame people, uh, you know, who's that? Somebody's wife just got, well, Alan West and his wife, I think both got it. People are celebrating that. Yeah, like hoping they die. Yeah, you know? it's uh, it just, it's fucking disgusting. Yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy yeah. to me that, 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 again, like this this single thing, like and like I said, there's, there's nothing else in our society, at least that I can think of, that's that way. Mm -hmm. You know, there's all these other things that, that if you're going to be that way about this, why are you not way, that way about all mm -hmm. these other fucking things that are bigger problems data-wise in our, in our society? You know, I, I was a mask advocate early on. You know, now I, I've, my position on that has evolved now that we have more data. You know, especially it's the whole concept of double masking or, or I'm vaccinated. I'm not going to mask. That, that was the whole reason I got, one of the reasons I got vaccinated. So I'm not a big, you know, I even did a podcast episode where I said, just wear the damn mask. And again, it's like, and my whole couching of that was, hey, we're, we don't know what we don't know. Empirically speaking, this makes sense that it would, that it would help somewhat. 
Ironically enough, we saw the impact in the flu. We didn't see the impact necessarily in COVID. Yeah. Right? It curtailed flu cases. It didn't curtail COVID cases. Um, I'm, I'm an advocate of the vaccine, not an advocate of mandates. I don't think anybody, you know, I believe in body autonomy. Um, whole other conversation. If we're talking about people in the military or people working in healthcare. That is a whole, whether people want to acknowledge it or not, that is a whole different concept. Um, another conversation is the whole airlines thing. It's like two dudes sitting up in the front of the plane. You know, this isn't a disease that get, you know, Hey, guess what? The COVID is not going to cause him to suddenly become incapacitated in mid flight. So I don't care. Okay. Um, if he gets a blood clot, from the vaccine that could incapacitate him in, in, in mid flight. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, there's a lot of angles and most people who are on one side or the other aren't doing what you're doing. They're not looking at it from multiple angles. I will say this just, just, just because I need to get it out there is I have never, uh, the death numbers have never been, uh, what I've concentrated on the hospitalization numbers have always been what I've concentrated on. And I can tell you from having worked in medicine, you know, if, if you go all the way back to when I first worked in a hospital was, you know, again, was in the 18 Delta course. I've never admitted somebody to the hospital with the flu, right? So flu hospital, what you see in the flu is, you know, 90% of people, 99% of people are down here doing just fine. And they're sitting at home eating chicken soup and a couple of days off work. And then one, one to 2% are here, get admitted and die horribly, right? We don't see a lot of this in the middle jamming up hospital beds but from a percentage of population standpoint is it not real fucking close what do you mean in terms of the the mortality rate of covid versus the flu no the mortality rate is but that's not where i'm going is is, is the morbidity rate so the rate of people who had to get admitted to the hospital because they had an oxygen requirement or whatever it might be that's way higher yeah. exponentially higher yeah. so where that plays in and i'm not is the effect, the the tertiary and quaternary effects that that has on the healthcare system, in that uh, oh we now we're having to cancel cardiac catheterizations now we're having to, because we don't have the we don't have the recovery beds for these patients now we have trauma centers that the ICU is full so they're having to go on divert I I uh, I haven't worked clinically I worked in the early days of COVID and then because I was working what they call locums when the census dropped off because people frankly, were scared to go to the hospital, and rightly so. Um, they didn't have the shifts for guys like me who were only like part-timers. So I got cut out of the pie. So I haven't worked a clinical shift in over 12 months now, right? So it was only in the early days of COVID that I worked. But a lot of my colleagues are talking about having one patient early in the shift that needs to be transferred, needs a bed. They don't have a bed. And they then spend the entire shift playing phone tag all over the state of Texas trying to find a bed to put this patient in. So, so that's, and, and I know it, it, it seems a little bit like a non sequitur, but that when, when you hear when you see a lot of the people in healthcare who are very impassioned about this and get very worked up about it, that's where they're coming from. I, I understand that. I, I guess there's two, two points I would bring up. One of them is a question, which is the, the overall bed capacity in most emergency rooms and hospitals prior to 18 months ago, or but before anybody even heard the term COVID, what is there an average capacity that that's available or or filled? I mean, whatever that is, is it, you know, what what's the percent capacity that's taken on any given day in a, in a normal hospital? Do you know? It uh, depends on location. Depends yeah. on location and the specific hospital, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd be curious what that number is now. Is that is there that drastic of a difference? It sounds like that's what they're it saying. It is, and that's why in in but, places like Austin, you know, they had they were converting. They basically converted the convention center into another hospital. Yeah. The problem was that they didn't have, uh, was, was finding the people to work there once, yeah. once they got it all stood up. Yeah. But you know, it, it's, there's something that occurs in emergency medicine that we've, we've always hated and has become more and more common is what's called boarding people in the ER, yeah. which is we don't have a bed for them upstairs or they don't meet because of their insurance, they don't meet admission criteria, so they're on observation status in the ER. Yeah, um, I've got colleagues now who are coming on shift, and they're sending me screen captures of, they're in a 25-bed ER. 20 of those beds are boarded COVID patients yeah. because there's no beds upstairs. Yeah. So that means they have five working beds in the ER. Yeah. 
So, uh, so the, I guess that's the first question. The, the second thing, which is a point, is is that, again, I, I think, is that when you look at it from, from that standpoint, is that there's a lot of other things that you're not taking into consideration that you could, you could easily justify as, as having the same heartburn about. You know, again, I, I would wonder of, of those 20 boarded COVID patients, how many of them are, are not overweight? You know, how, how many of them don't, don't completely have... Val completely valid question. Well, but so, yeah, so here's my point to that is, is not just that's the point. The point with that, that statement is, is that, okay, so COVID is one thing out of a, out of a list of problems that this person has. The, the, the bitch that I have and the heartburn that I have is the cherry picking of COVID-19 by itself with mm -hmm. none of those other things taken into account. Mm -hmm. And again, just like these other hosts of problems that kill people, these hosts of comorbidities that land them in the hospital in the first fucking place that wouldn't mm -hmm. have landed them otherwise. There's no mandates about not being a fat fuck. Mm -hmm. There's no mandates about giving yourself type two diabetes. There's no mandates about fucking smoking. There's no mandates about you've drank yourself into cirrhosis of the liver. And now that's a big fucking problem mm -hmm. there. And, and all these other things, cancer, you know, a lot of lifestyles, people's choices in their lifestyles contribute to cancer. Of course, not all of them, but a lot of them, mm -hmm. you know, are they being shamed? Oh, fuck you. You're not getting chemo. You put yourself there because you couldn't put the fucking Marlboros down. Mm -hmm. That's not happening. Right. You know, and, and so, again, it's like there, there's such a singular fucking um, focus on just this one fucking thing that 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 it doesn't apply to any other fucking part of our life. And I, and I don't know why. Yeah. Well, I, I can tell you, I can tell you why it's, I mean, it's a human nature is, is to, to boil it down. How many times did you see this, that, uh, whether on deployment or not deployment, your, your unit has a problem that needs to be solved and everyone, and it's the commander decides that that's the pet fucking problem for the day. So everybody is running through their ass to solve this fucking problem, whatever it is. Yeah. And all along you're thinking at your level, A, B, C, and D in advance, we could have, this problem never would have happened. Right. <laughs> but what ends up happening is you run through your ass, you solve the, you solve that problem, not the contributors that were led up to it. Right. And then everybody breathes a sigh of relief and they move on. And then two years down the road, that problem rears its ugly head again. Right. We're doing the same thing now is we're not looking at all of the problems that led to those people, all those core morbidities. We're only looking at the, the problem that manifested it. Yeah. Um, and Rogan talks about it that, you know, we, we should have been emphasizing during lockdown is, Hey, take this as some time to go outside and walk in the fresh air yeah. in the sunlight and get some exercise. And we didn't do that. Yeah. Right. I, yeah. I, I mean, I agree. I think it's been handled uh, exceptionally poorly from, from the start. Uh, I just, uh, you know, to me, I, 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 I would have hoped um, that, that because our society is not as tight knit as a military unit is when there's this one problem, everybody runs like lemmings off of a fucking ship right? to fix it <laughs> is that there would be enough goddamn critical thinkers um, you know, to, to, to sit back and be like, wait a minute, let me, let me take a, a little more objective approach here. But I, know, I think that leads back to we've come full circle and that our education system doesn't teach people to critically think anymore. I think any of those critical thinkers that were in the room that might've, you know, chimed in with something like that, the, the way that they would get shot down is all right, well, that, that solves the next fucking pandemic. It doesn't solve this one. What are we doing about this one? Right. Cause they want to concentrate on this shiny object that's in front of them right yeah. now. And the, the really sad thing is, is we're not going to learn anything from this, right? Yeah. So the dust is going to fucking settle. And years down the road, we're going to have a similar issue. And it's going to be the same thing. The people with all the comorbidities, 90% of which were brought on by bad lifestyle choices are going to, and see that's, and that's the case in almost, you know, globally is 80% of your resources, especially when it comes to healthcare goes to taking care of people that made a lot of bad decisions. Yeah. Whether that was driving drunk and they're yeah. in your trauma ICU or they smoke two packs a day and they're on a ventilator, right? A huge, and, and I literally pulled that number out of thin air, so don't quote me on that. But a huge amount of your resources goes to those and we're dealing with that again. Now, I mean, there's outliers. I know uh, out of those cases that I mentioned at the guys that I rolled with jujitsu, one of them ended up in the hospital with an oxygen requirement and he's healthy as fuck. Yeah. Um, 
But again, he's an outlier. You know, most of the bad outcomes they already had. But he, but here's the sad thing: is in the U.S. So I looked at the I I looked, and I haven't I, I haven't relooked this in in about three or four months. But the last time I looked, and I looked at, I actually I saw a real honest table of all the comorbidities and all of the deaths. <clears throat> 60% of the U.S. population has at least one of those comorbidities yeah. right now. At least 60%. Yeah. So it's, you know, the, the, the kind of the question is, you know, another way to look at this, and I'm not justifying it, but it's kind of like, you know, we're on the Titanic and water's rushing in. Are we, are, we, are we arguing the guy in the map room or arguing the guy that was steering the boat? Or are we just going to do something about this? Yeah. So that's in their defense. I'm not saying they're right, but that's in their mind. They're doing what's going to take care of getting people in the lifeboats now, not what got us here. Yeah. But the answer is we need to be looking at both. Uh, we need to recognize, you know, it, if body autonomy is either an absolute or it's not an absolute. So if, if it's okay to smoke and it's okay to drink every day and it's okay to have unprotected intercourse uh, at a glory hole in San Francisco, no less. Maybe uh, then it's then it's then it's okay to not wear a mask yeah. and not get a vaccine. And again, you know, I got vaccinated. My family got vaccinated. I want people. I understand. I understand your pause. Um, I'm not going to celebrate if you tell me to get vaccinated. I'm not going to lose sleep if you tell me you're not going to get vaccinated. I want people to get. You know, and I still want people to get vaccinated because I think it will reduce, if nothing else. It will reduce our hospitalizations that will, because that's the number that's always concerned me mm -hmm. is filling up the hospital at capacity. And then somebody who didn't get COVID, who did everything right, who was living a healthy lifestyle, but something tragic happened to them. Now they're being shuttled all around central Texas, looking for a hospital that will admit them because everybody's full through no fault of their own. Yeah. I'm concerned about that person, you know, so yes, I would like everybody to get vaccinated, but, uh, but mandates, no, I, yeah. you know, talking down to people who don't get vaccinated. No, yeah. yeah. wishing people who get it that aren't vaccinated. That, yeah, hundred percent wrong. Twisted, yeah. It's now twisted. I'll have, you know, it's yeah. pre. I even I wrote a I wrote a blog. This was way pre COVID. Uh, it's funny. I went on Kyle Lamb's podcast and I'd forgotten about it. And he brought it up. I wrote a blog like two three years ago, and it was called "Are Anti Vaxxers Domestic Terrorists?" Because I had at the time on social media, I had dealt with so many Karens who thought they knew so much about vaccines. And, and I was always getting the same arguments, right? And again, I see there's some overlap from that in this, but there's some entirely new arguments in this too. And you brought up a lot of them. You know, not only the, the new nature of this as a virus, the new nature of it as a vaccine, the fact that we don't know long-term effects, these are all very valid things, right? And also, you know, what, what is it really protecting? You know, what is the efficacy? Do we really know? Yeah. Um, I think a lot of this hasn't, you know, in the, the hospital census problem is something that I don't think is anybody has adequately explained to the public. Yeah. You know, when you, when you meet a doctor and they're concerned and they're worn out and they're just like, I'm fucking tired of having this fucking argument. If you peel back the layer on that, most of them, that's why, because they're going to work every day and they're seeing what we call bedlock. And they're like, when is this going to stop? I need this to stop. And and they're frustrated. And a lot of people are not, uh, on both sides of this, are not handling it well. And I'll tell you another thing is, uh, and I've been guilty of this myself, is when you try to when you try to break down a complex issue into meme format, yeah, it just doesn't work. And you're doing yourself a disservice, and you're doing the people that you disagree with a disservice as well. Yeah, and, and especially, I mean, I've talked about this a lot on, on a lot of different uh, subjects or issues, uh, you know, when you're having these discussions on online, uh, you know, where you have uh, the, the intent to respond and not understand when you're reading yes. some of these comments, yeah. then, then uh, you know, you're never going to win. And, and think, you don't see that person as a person. Yeah. It's not like this conversation that you and yeah. I are having. And that's why I do everything in person. I don't, yeah. Like I don't even do it Zoom for that same reason. It's just not the same. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, if, if my goal and intent is to, is to prove that I'm right or change your mind and yours is the same, it's it's what you see all day every day on fucking Twitter and Facebook and whatever else is that people just argue and, and dehumanize one another. And again, like I would ask anybody listening, like when was the last time somebody legitimately fucking changed your mind in, a, in an argument online? 
it's never happened for me, <laughs> you know, yeah. so, which is why I don't do it and haven't in years. Yeah. Uh, like, I, I just don't even fucking, I mean, I don't, I don't, I've, I've re looked some time, things but, from, from some information that I've gotten online yeah. before. But uh, you're probably arguing with a, maybe a higher caliber of person. But. Yeah. And, it, and it's a, and it's a little, and I, I like to think that I'm open minded enough to be, to yeah. be open to that. But. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's another point I bring up in the book is, is you, you have to go into, to any, in, into any conversation uh, with the notion that you might be wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and almost nobody does that, yeah. you know, but. Well, and that's, uh, so, uh, and still talking about COVID, but the hydroxychloroquine thing is a good example because I came in early on. I was hopeful when I first heard about it, I was very hopeful. And then when the initial studies came in and they didn't bear it out and I did an episode on it and I said, okay, here's what the studies say. Now there might be a study that comes in down the road that says it does work, but the, and I gave an example of a study that supposedly said it worked that was radically flawed. <clears throat> and then I gave an example of a study that showed it did not work. Now, both of those studies ended up getting completely debunked later yeah. on down the road. Yeah. Okay. The one that was flawed got shown for its flaws. Turned out that the one that showed it didn't work, they'd made up some of the data. Yeah. And I talked about that. And then more data came out later. And, and the data as it looks now is, is hydroxychloroquine probably does nothing. Yeah. Okay. There's a little tiny, tiny bit of data that maybe if you're already healthy and the moment you get exposed, you start taking it, it'll lessen the course. Yeah. Maybe. They're not even sure on that. But the people that would argue, and I got to say, retired SF guys were the worst about hydroxychloroquine. They like they all want were convinced that it 100% worked. And they would argue with me, and, I, and I, would, I called it link spamming, is rather than, you know, what I would say, okay, what, you know, show me the double blind placebo controlled trial where it worked. They would just start cutting. They would go to Google in another window, hydroxychloroquine for COVID. And they would start cutting and pasting all of the, like they're throwing them at me, yeah. throwing them at me. And I've read, and I had already read all these articles and I said, you do realize you just sent me four articles that disprove your point, right? And that's how I know you either didn't read them or didn't understand them because all four of those articles disprove your side of the argument. Yeah. So don't, and again, but it's the desire to win the argument yeah. is I'm going to go out there. I'm going to find all the ammo in the world. I'm calling in fucking indirect fire on your ass because I don't want to lose this yeah. argument. Yeah. No, and again, like I just, I don't understand why people get so far in the weeds on shit that, that ultimately kind of doesn't matter that way. But uh, again, just my take is, you know, show me the data that says that, that I have a high incidence of, you know, or a good chance that I'm going to die from it. Now you have my interest you know, here's a, here's an elixir that's going to keep you from catching it or giving it to somebody uh, fucking shoot it, shoot me up with it right fucking now. Yeah. If those things aren't the case, shove it up your ass. You know yeah. I mean? To me, it's that simple. Dude, but. I, I knew, uh, I'm healthy enough. I never had a concern that I was going to get COVID and die Yeah, ever. I was never concerned about death. Things I didn't want. I don't want to be hospitalized just because I don't want to be hospitalized. I don't want to tie up that bed and I don't want, uh, I don't want long-term effects. Yeah. You know, I don't want six months down the road and I still, uh, my cardio still sucks, yeah. you know, cause I got what they call long COVID. Yeah. Those were my reasons. Yeah. And, you know? and to me, like, I, you know, I'm not going to try to talk anybody out of it. I'm not going to try to talk anybody into it. Uh, I just want to be left the fuck alone with it, you know, and that's it. And, and have some consistency societally with, uh, with stuff like that erring on the side of leaving people the fuck alone because otherwise where does where does it end but Dude, i'm i'm primarily a, a libertarian constitutionalist and i re, i respect your body autonomy and i respect your right to make your own decision and i don't give two fucks if you disagree with me on it yeah. i'm still your friend and i'll still be in the same room with you so especially if uh, <laughs> it's a broomstick shoved up my ass <laughs> then uh, we're gonna have a whole different conversation on that note maybe we should mandate yeah, yeah. something no, no broomsticks <laughs> barbed broomsticks that you can't shove up your ass uh, all right, so I, I know we're running low on time here. Um, where uh, where can people find you and uh, and find the book? So they can uh, find me. I'm on social media. Uh, I spend most of my social media time on Instagram at Dr. Mike Simpson. D R M I K E S I M P S O N. Um, Graybeard Performance. My company also uh, has an IG site. I'm trying to cultivate a following for Graybeard Performance. So if you give them a follow, I'd appreciate it. My website is graybeardperformance.com. And my book is available. If you go to Graybeard Performance, there's a link to my book right there. But Or you can just go straight to Amazon uh, and get my book on Amazon in all formats. Amen. Rock and roll. Uh, I appreciate you coming up here. It's been uh, it's been good uh, waxing poetic with you for the last few hours. I, I appreciate your, uh, your service. Thank you for it. 
I uh, certainly appreciate your perspective uh, and have, have enjoyed talking with you. So, Thank you for the forum, brother. I really appreciate yeah, it. Absolutely. Uh, that's it, folks. I uh, appreciate your guys' uh, willingness to tune in each episode. I won't say week after week because let's be honest, I don't drop one every week or even close to it. But uh, at any rate, I've said that like 30 times now. Uh, I appreciate every everybody tuning in. Without you guys, we wouldn't uh, be here flapping our gums. So thank you for uh, for your support. And until next time, this is Mike Drop. Mike Drop.